Hi, Chris. Thanks for joining me, friend. Yeah, my absolute pleasure, man. Thanks so much for having me. So I'd love to start with the question that I ask everybody, which is just, you know, kind of introducing yourself and if um, in particular, kind of what's your background and life story as you understand it today? Yeah, yeah. cool. So uh, let's see, my name is Chris Orozco. Um, I've been teaching shadow integration professionally for about seven years now. Been practicing it for about 10, uh, nine and a half. And most of what I teach has been based on my own personal experience of just kind of figuring out my own brain. Um, I was raised by a family of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, which, you know, I didn't vibe with very much, especially because I experienced some trauma early on that gave me questions that they couldn't answer. So I started kind of doing my own thing and living my own life, which led to me getting kicked out of the house at 16, finding my own way of life, um, and ultimately learning shadow integration after a series of mental health problems. Uh And so I ended up just realizing that my, I was able to turn my life around pretty significantly. And so now I teach people what I did. Amazing. Amazing. And, um, yeah, uh, Chow Chu, who, you know, who kind of suggested I have you on, uh, mentioned that you have like a really crazy backstory of how you got into this. And it seems like you sort of alluded to some of that, but I'd love to hear kind of in some more depth, any of the detail that you feel like you'd be willing to share about, about some of those chapters of your life. Sure. You, you got it, man. So huh, I forgot to have a cat in my room. No so, problem. Um, so basically, uh, like I said, I was raised by a family of Jehovah's Witnesses, um, which was fine. I didn't really question that all too much, but then my dad died when I was seven. Mm-hmm. And so that filled me with all kinds of questions and stuff that I was just really unhappy with the answers that I got from the church. All they seemed capable of doing was reading from the Bible Um, giving me canned scripted responses. It seemed like nobody could speak from the heart. Nobody had actually thought through anything that they were saying. And none of it seemed human. So it was really unsatisfying to me. And so that was when I started asking my own questions and kind of doing my own thing. And it eventually led me to kind of live alternative lifestyles that got me kicked out of my house at 16, uh, which was really, really fun for a long time. You know, like being homeless in Orange County is not actually being homeless. All my friends were rich. And so I could just hide in their houses Hmm. Um, I had to sleep in some bathtubs, hmm. uh, had to hide under desks from like the dad every once in a while. Um, I had to jump off of a roof to get away from this stepdad who was like a Navy SEAL who threatened to kill me if he found me in the house again. Uh, and there was like a whole bunch of really weird stuff in that time of my life, but it was also really fun. Um, but unfortunately, I did have a series of mental health problems that started when I lost my dad. And mm. they started off as me being really narcissistic, uh, really overly aggressive, um, and just not really caring about anybody but myself and just being a typical teenage kind of asshole. And then I realized that I was hurting people. I hurt this, this girl that I was dating. And I was like, wow, that's really, that's really messed up. I don't want to be doing that. So I decided to take all that rage and aim it inwards. And that was when my problems really started. Um, Because before I was having fun, you know, being the like narcissistic, aggressive teenager just makes you a cool kid that people respect and think is awesome because kids are dumb and don't know any better. But once I aimed all that inwards and I started suffering a lot, I started losing my confidence. I started, I went through periods of time where I couldn't speak out loud because I was so worried about hurting people. And my world just kept getting smaller and smaller because I was so afraid of hurting people that the amount of things I could do and say and think kept shrinking. And then I kept shrinking as a result of that. And the anxiety was encroaching more and more and more until I felt like I could barely live anymore. And it all really kind of hit its head when I was living in San Francisco with an ex. And uh, she's a really good friend of mine now. I absolutely love her. But at the time, she had admitted to, I was living with her and three of her or two of her friends. And they had all kind of admitted to taking a lot of their anti-male sentiments out on me. Mm. And I was in a really fragile place. So it, it almost fucking broke me. Mm. And so the thing that really scared me into a new way of life and scared me into learning shadow integration was I was sitting there, you know, having this really hard time. And I was thinking like, oh my God, I'm such a loser. Like she's going to break up with me. Like, what am I going to do? I don't deserve her. Like I'm, I'm such a loser, blah, 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 blah. And then this thought, this really scary thought entered my head. And it was like, oh, I'll just kill her. Mm. And I was like, Jesus, like that is a horrible thing to think. And because I was so afraid of it just scared the life out of me I thought I was like some monster going down this like dark horrible path that I could never get myself out of and it just it for years it got worse and worse and worse until I thought that I had a moral option to actually end my life to protect 
everyone in my life from what I thought I was becoming. And that's when I found shadow integration. Um, friends that I was living with, one of these girls, so not all bad stuff came from it. She actually introduced me to some core ideas that changed my life. And she said, Chris, you're not broken. You're just taking really poor care of yourself. And in that moment, a light went off and I was like, wait a minute, why, do, why is that true? I, I know that's true for some reason, tell me more. And then she just kind of explained some more ideas that changed my life. And she said, you're not just one thing, you're a collection of different parts. And those parts vary in degree of health, depending on how well you take care of them. And so these thoughts that you're having, they're just the result of you taking really, really poor care of the part of you that is generating these thoughts. And so to me, I don't know why it was just one of those things that like you hear it and you just instantly recognize it as true. And you're like, okay, there's my light out of the tunnel. Like I can actually survive now. I, I have a way out. And so I spent the next, you know, few years just diving really deep into that concept and learning how to love myself and learning how to listen to myself and really owning that this, this rage that I had was the result of, of needs not being met and these parts of me not being taken care of. So I had to learn how to do all that. And this type of stuff hadn't become popular yet. This was like almost 10 years ago. And so there was nobody to teach me. Um, so I had to kind of learn through trial and error over the course of a long period of time. And within two years, because um, I'd also joined a men's group, I had started taking Kung Fu, um, I got into fire spinning, and whatever I could do to help channel some of this anger. And within two years, I went from being the youngest, most inexperienced and mentally fucked up member of my men's group to suddenly being a leader in the group that people respected and wanted my advice and wanted my take on things. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Two years ago, my mind was like a, a source of constant torture and suffering. And now my mind is a source of support and inspiration for the people that I respect and admire. Like, how did I do that? And so I thought about it and I was like, oh, wait a minute, I know exactly how I did it. I, I took notes on it. I made sure I remembered it. So that was when, it, that was when I decided to teach people what I'd done. And uh, that was seven years ago, and it's been going really strong ever since then. That's amazing. Um, I'd love to hear, like, it, it's really interesting that you kind of had to discern for yourself what the steps forward were and how to make use of the wisdom that your friend gave you. And I wonder, like, what kinds of things, I mean, you mentioned taking up like Kung Fu and fire spinning and joining a men's group, but like, what was your approach and, and what did you, what kinds of lessons did you have to learn as you went through that process? Yeah, that's a good question. So I had a lot, you know, because all I really knew was that all these parts of me that weren't being taken care of, they needed to be listened to, they needed to be loved and accepted. And ultimately, they just had needs that weren't being met. And if I could figure out what that need was and find a way to meet it in a healthier way, then every part of me, no matter how dysfunctional, would become healthier eventually. And that's all I knew going into it. And so the first hardest thing was trying to figure out what loving myself meant, you know, cause people tell you to love yourself all the time, but nobody tells you what that looks like. They don't tell you how to do it. They don't, they don't really give you any supporting or helpful information to aid you in the process of learning to love yourself. So I just went into it. I remember sitting on the bus in say, cause I was living in San Francisco at the time. And I was like, okay, so what does that mean to love myself? Like, how would I do that? I, I hate these parts of myself. How could I possibly love them? Like, I don't, how do you love something that you hate? Like paradox hadn't made sense to me yet. And so I was, I was racking my brain over this for months and I could not figure out how to love these things that I hated. And then one of the most significant moments was when the whole concept of needing a reason to love something broke down. And I was like, oh, I don't need a reason. My, my reason is if I love the thing and care for it genuinely, then it will get healthier and it will get better. And if I treat it poorly and continue to not love it, it will get worse. And for me, that my whole notion that love needs to be earned and love is deserved and all those sorts of things it just completely broke and it's just like no love is just something that you give to a system or an individual or a part of yourself if you want that system or person or whatever to to thrive and i was like and i want to thrive so cool like i can now give love to this thing indiscriminately without needing a reason and that was probably the biggest breakthrough but then subsequently after that the the next biggest breakthrough i learned was um you can't fake it because you're you. you, you know if you're lying, you know if you're faking it and you know if you're trying to manipulate yourself and loving yourself for like in a transactional way to try and get something out of this part of yourself, you know it's manipulation and so that that part of you will never trust you. And so I had to learn how to be able to do it very genuinely and just love this thing just because I wanted it to be healthy. Even if it never gave me anything, even if it never 
did anything for me in return. I just wanted it to, to feel loved because I, it broke my heart to know how poorly I've been treating myself and how poorly I've been treating these parts of myself. I, I let that break my heart so that I could actually want something better. I, I, I started to see myself as the abuser of these parts mm -hmm. rather than the victim being abused by the parts. I, I saw myself as the perpetrator and I was just like, fuck, like, I'm sorry. I had apologies. I had compassion. And, and that moving away from the transactional frame into the like, I'm so sorry, I messed your life up. Like that was a really, really big lesson that I learned early on. And those two lessons probably are at the foundation of everything that you build on from there. Hmm. What did giving yourself that self-love look like once you ha had that like harmonious desire to give it to yourself? What did that look like? It was, it was, it was born from like a, like just a, a realization of these horrible mistakes I didn't realize I was making, you know, all these younger parts of myself that had been hurt by the world, you know, like I, I watched my dad die on the floor, like I saw it happen. And the version of me that got so scared of, of the world at that point instead of loving that part of me and caring for that part of me and giving it what it really needed, I bullied it for decades. I got mad at it and told it that it didn't deserve to exist because it was so afraid and so scared of engaging with the world. And I was being such a dickhead to it that like, of course it had become dysfunctional. And by the time I could see things from that perspective, it's like, it just became obvious that like, of course you love the thing. Like it, it's a scared child. Mm. And like, if you ever saw a scared child or like a wounded puppy or something helpless and innocent that was in pain and, and suffering. It's like bullying it and being mean to it is the last thing you would do. Like mm -hmm. you would just love it and you would take care of it. And so for me, it just kind of came naturally once I realized what I was actually dealing with and, and what I'd actually done and why things had gotten as bad as they were. For me, it was just, it broke the floodgates open and I was just really sorry and just wanted to make things better. Hmm. What did that scared child part need? Um, well, for me, the, obviously the first thing is, you know, validation that like, I see that you're scared and it's okay that you're scared and then love, like, I love you, even though you're scared. But for me as an individual, when my dad died, you know, I was, it was two weeks before my birthday. So I was about to turn seven. And mm -hmm. for me, it broke my world. Cause my, mm -hmm. my mom, I didn't, I don't remember, but my mom told me that my dad was everything to me. Mm -hmm. And so losing him was, was like losing the foundation of my reality. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it, it communicated very early on that the world is a dangerous, chaotic place where the things that I love most, that mean the most to me can be taken away at a moment's notice and there isn't anything I can do about it. Mm. And that was a lesson I learned far too early and took me a long time to make peace with. But ultimately what this part of me needed to know was that yes, that is the truth. Like the world is a dangerous, chaotic place at times and you can lose anything and everything that you love at a moment's notice, and you can't do a goddamn thing about it. Mm. And what this part of me needed was to know that that's okay. Mm. And that I'm still, that somebody is still going to be there to take care of him, to make sure that he doesn't lose things unnecessarily. And someone's watching out for his best interest to make sure that he gets to keep the things that he loves as much as he wants to, but to also know that if he does lose something that he loves and cares about, that he'll still be okay. And that even though my dad wasn't there to look after me anymore, that I could be the one to look after me and I could be the one to look after him. And the more real I make that lesson, the more, you know, cause like I, we were talking about before the call started, I just had to break up with my girlfriend a few um, months ago. Hmm. And that was really difficult for me because that's loss. And it translates to my father wound of like abandonment. Hmm. And hmm. I had to tell this part of myself again, it's like, yeah, this sucks. You lost somebody that you love and someone that you really cared about and someone that you really wanted to be with. And your life will go on and I'll be here to make sure that you're okay and to make sure mm -hmm. that we fight for your best interest and for what you truly want and to make sure that you get the best out of life and mm -hmm. for me that has allowed me to feel so much peace um, no matter what happens in my life mm -hmm. even under really difficult circumstances like that yeah exactly because yeah, at sense. least I know I have my back like I get to be the father that I lost when I was seven mm -hmm. yeah my heart really feels for your small child, like, you know, six, seven and losing your dad. And then also just feel really moved and inspired hearing, um, you know, older Chris, like taking care of yourself and like being a good father to yourself and, and how you've made that transition. It's like really nourishing for me. So thank you for sharing that.
Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Once, once I unlocked the part of myself that is actually the father archetype mm -hmm. and I could feel that presence in my life. And I realized that there was somebody in my body and in my mind that was always going to be there for me and always going to look out for me, always going to stand up for me and always going to take care of me. Like I only got that. I'm 35 now. I got that at 33, maybe mm. 34. And so like the amount of peace and comfort that that's allowed into my life even though it took me almost a decade to get to, it's like, man, so worth it. Mm. How did you find that uh, like father archetype part within yourself? Yeah. So my approach has always been to trust that whatever I, whatever part of me I need and whatever I'm missing is already in here. It's just buried. Mm. So for me, the approach is like, okay, I know I have a father archetype in me. I know I have a masculine side in there somewhere. He, the only reason I don't have access to him, the only reason I don't feel him on an, on an everyday ongoing basis is because I've covered him up for some reason. Mm. So for me, the question always is like, how, what am I doing to cover this up? And I know for me, I was so afraid of engaging with the world that I had completely covered up the part of me that like wanted to engage with the world and, and wanted to go out and do things. And my, essentially my masculine side, I had completely covered that up because I was so afraid of like, okay, well, if I go and engage with the world then like bad things will happen and the things that I love will be taken away from me and I can't do anything about it. I'm helpless and I'm fucked. So it's like, I'm just going to stay small and I'm going to cover this part of myself up forever. And so in order to get that father archetype to the surface, I had to face my fear of losing things over and over and over again and be like, it's okay to lose things. You're in fact, you can't avoid it. Like you're, everyone you know is going to die. Like every person alive is going to die. There's nothing you can do about that. Everything is, it's like, like you know, the impermanence lesson from Buddhism. It's, it's mm -hmm. such a big one because everything is impermanent. And so leaning on that and telling this little kid inside of me, like over and over and over again, that like, everything's okay. I'll, I'll be there for you. And over enough period of time, I started to believe that more and more. And then I started to feel more and more confident in my skills to be able to take care of myself, no matter what happened. And then eventually that led to really facing like the depth of the wound and the despair and the fear. And once I faced the real depth of it, the father archetype was able to, to rise out of, out of that. Hmm. When you tell that part of yourself, like that everything's okay, it sounds like that doesn't mean like, oh, there are no problems or no challenges, but that you're going to love yourself no matter what and be, do the best you can no matter what. Is that, is that yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, I'm, it's like you're talking to a six-year-old or almost to be seven-year-old who saw his father die in front of him. Mm -hmm. You can't tell him everything's okay. Yeah, he exactly. Knows he knows that's not true. And if you tell him that, for me, my go-to is rage. So mm -hmm. when people tell me something, everything's okay, when I know damn well that's not the case, I would, I would go, I would have rage blackouts when I was a kid. I would just go black and wake up and everyone around me was crying. And I'd be like, what the fuck happened? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what I did. Mm -hmm. So that was never an option for me. I, I had to say like, yeah, the world can be really fucked sometimes. Like there are horrible, terrible, awful things that happen to good people all the time. And I will be there to make sure that good things happen to you. And that if bad things do happen to you, that you will have somebody who loves and cares about you to make sure that you're taken care of. And I'll get you a good community. I'll make you plenty of money. I'll get you a strong body. Um, I'll learn whatever I need to learn in order to make sure that you feel safe and secure no matter what happens. Mm. Mm. I feel really nourished just hearing you say that. I'm like, there are <laughs> definitely parts of me that are like, yeah, okay, I need to tell myself <laughs> yeah. that. So thanks totally. for that. That's Were there any other um, like important aspects of yourself that you had to look at and heal or integrate? Yeah, um, one of the biggest ones was, this is something that Chow Chu, um, our mutual friend actually helped me with. Um, mm. I went to a, uh, a sexual blueprint, erotic blueprint conference with Chow Chu and some other friends. And uh, he facilitated a healing session for me in the, in the hotel afterwards. And it, it facilitated one of the biggest breakthroughs I've ever had um, because I didn't know this at the time, but when what apparently little kids do to try and gain control over chaotic experiences is they blame themselves. Hmm. And it's like, that's what I did when I was a kid. You know, the idea that the world is just that scary and chaotic was just way too much for me to comprehend hmm. at the time. And so instead, since I was in the room when it happened, I told myself that it was my fault for not doing more. Wow. And that I, if I would have done more, if I would have known what was happening, if I would have done something, I could have saved him. But this was his fifth heart attack. He only had one. Kid. 
he was on dialysis. He had multiple hernias. Like there, he was, he was going to die. There was nothing I was, I could do about it. He was very sick for a long time. He was going to die, but I blame myself anyway. And so for a long period of time, I walked around with the story that I was essentially evil mm -hmm. and that I was an evil person for letting my father die. And I, I told, I thought I had killed him. Was that and conscious or was it like subconscious? It was very, very unconscious. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, I made that decision as a little kid. And yeah. then the idea that I was a bad person just kind of stuck with me for the rest of my life right. because that was my way of avoiding all of the pain and the chaos and the, the helplessness and the despair. But our friend Chow Chu helped me see past that and helped me see that that was just a story to protect myself from the chaos. And so the more I could face the chaos and hold it and be okay with it and realize that there is something solid for me to lean on, even in the face of chaos, then the belief that I was a bad person stopped serving me anymore mm -hmm. and I could finally let go of it. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really, really big one. Um, yeah, the idea that I'm hopeless and there's nothing I can do in this dangerous, chaotic world, the idea that I was a bad person, that was a really big one. Um, cause that's what made me not want to hurt people. Cause I was like, Oh fuck, I hurt a really good person. I really am a bad person. I need mm. to stop this. And so it, my world got smaller and smaller. So once I could face this fear of being a bad person, my world really opened up in some really big ways. What, what happened in that direction that Chachu helped you with? Like what, what um, shifted there? Yeah. The, the big shift was realizing that it was never my fault. That was just something that I told myself to protect myself from how scary and chaotic the world is and then once i understood that i was like okay well i can face chaos i can face scary i can face danger like a face to death like who cares about a little chaos i can deal with chaos and so once i could put it into context and stop seeing it as like the need to see myself as a good person instead it's the need to face the chaos underneath and stop having a reason to call myself a bad person once I understood that, then I could just face the chaos and then the whole story just started falling apart on its own. Hmm. I imagine that wasn't just like, um, I mean, cause you could, you could kind of say those words to yourself or write them down or something, but they might not hit. And like, what, what was it in that interaction that really helped you to get that on a deep level? Yeah. So, uh, Chow Chu at the time was practicing this. I don't even remember what it's called. Um, but it's this, it, there's elements of this in my coaching, but this is a very specified way of doing things where he'll have you kind of repeat a sentence that resonates over and over and over again. And then if the sentence, if what resonates shifts, then you start speaking the new thing over and over and over again. And you don't really pay too much attention, but as you're doing that, you'll start to hear yourself say things you didn't know you believed. And you <laughs> hear yourself start to say things and, and express things that you didn't know were in there. And through maybe an hour and a half of doing that uh, with Chow Chu holding space, eventually, I don't remember exactly what happened because I was mm -hmm. kind of in an altered state, like <laughs> more of a trance. I wasn't like drunk or high or anything, but it was, it was sure. a very surreal experience. Um, and so over an hour and a half of doing that, I, I, I said something that I was like, oh, wait a minute, mm -hmm. like, there's more to this. Uh -huh. like, I don't actually think I'm a bad person. And then I was like, okay, just keep going, keep going, keep going. And then I realized, I'm like, oh my God, I'm just saying that because I'm scared. Mm -hmm. And once I realized that it, it became easy to, to know what I needed to do, because it's just like, okay, great. I, now I know what I'm afraid of. So let me just go face it. Mm -hmm. I imagine that was uh, biomotive. He, he and I have both yes, done that. And yeah, um, that was, that's been super helpful for me. And, and I, you know, it's interesting. You described being a kind of like trance state and like when I've gone really deep into that stuff, it's like often there's um, like disassociation that comes up or like memory interference where like, it's really helpful to have someone holding the space because they can they can like write down the phrase like this is what you said and mm -hmm. like this is the thing that made you start just bawling and you can't totally. remember why and anyway yeah that makes total it's sense deep and it's like if you if you stay with the practice it takes you deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole and like yeah you dissociate you lose reality for a second because you're really in it and it can trigger some really cool stuff mm -hmm. what made you um want to start uh, your own coaching practice and helping people with this kind of stuff? Um, it's a good question. First thing was realizing that I had something to share that was really valuable. Um, but also I was, I was looking for, I've been, I knew I had some kind of life purpose since I was a little kid. Ever since I was maybe like 12 years old, I, I, I felt the sense of knowing that I had a purpose. And I don't know if that's something that I told myself, because I remember telling myself that like all this pain I'm going through at such a young age is going to be worth it one day. Mm. This will mm. pay off one day. This is for something. 
just keep going. And that was kind of my mantra when I was like 12 to 25 or whatever. Wow. Um, and so I always knew that it would pay off one day. And so I was kind of always on the hunt for what my thing would be. I knew I was destined for greatness or whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I tried a couple of different things. I worked on music festivals for a few years. Um, I wanted to throw parties at nightclubs and I did, and it was fun. Um, I tried a couple of different things, but they weren't fun enough for me to obsess over. And I knew that if I wanted to go the distance and, and really build something big, that it had to be an obsession. And so I thought about it for a little while and psychology is just, I think about it all the time. Like I'm constantly doing my own internal shadow work pretty much 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, 365 days a year. And so I was like, yeah, I'm thinking about that every moment of every day and I'm good at teaching it. And I have skills that a lot of people need. So for me, it was kind of like a no brainer. I was like, cool. I've been able to do cool things with this. Uh, I know what I'm talking about. I'm good at it. So let me just go teach it. And so I, I got some practice clients at the time. I was taking Kung Fu. So I asked my Kung Fu teacher how to get started. And he said, just coach people, see how it goes. So I did that. People got a lot of value out of what I was saying. Um, and I was actually able to help people without any training. And so I just kind of kept going with it and kept refining my approach. And I had to kind of extrapolate a lot of what was happening inside because I never tried to describe it to anyone before. So that process was kind of weird to try and like pick apart your own thought process as it's happening is it's a bizarre experience. It's really kind of surreal. Um, so I did that and then it just turned into my own kind of curriculum like my own version of parts work that has a lot in common with, you know, other different kinds, but it's, it's very much my own creation and I'm very grateful. I spent those years honing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How would you describe at this point, what you understand shadow work to be? Um, so I like to define, or I like to distinguish shadow work from shadow integration. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, shadow work is anything that allows you to acknowledge either your subconscious or your unconscious patterns, beliefs, all that sort of stuff. Like mindfulness meditation for me would be an example of shadow work. Mm -hmm. like, it's like finding the stuff. Yeah. And sitting with it, becoming aware of it, being present with it, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But shadow integration is when you take the active step of saying, okay, so all this stuff that I'm being aware of, whereas like if you're really into Zen or mindfulness, they'll tell you to just watch it and not really do anything with it, not really engage with it. But with shadow integration, it's like, okay, everything that I'm thinking, it's not just monkey mind. All of this is here for a reason. And it's all here for good reasons. And if I can understand those reasons and the needs that are being met, and if I can find healthier, better ways to meet those needs, then this part of me will actually become integrated into my being serving the purpose it was already intended to serve but in the healthiest way possible in alignment with my values up to my standards and in the service of that which I desire most so to me integration is is taking all the parts of you that you've thrown away and have told yourself that don't have value and kind of dusting them off and looking at them being like oh you were supposed to do this like you've just got some wires crossed like let me reprogram you the way you were meant to be programmed and it's like cool you're clean now like let's get to work and so you end up with more and more parts of you being allies and, and helpful, you know, pieces of your being rather than things that are pushing you in all these different directions and, and getting in the way and sabotaging your plans. They end up becoming these really valuable assets. Mm -hmm. How do you help people integrate their shadows? Uh, number one thing is, first off, um, so I, I teach shadow integration course that actually starts next week. And the very first thing that we do is we define their ideal vision and their ideal identity. Because one of the biggest pitfalls in shadow work or shadow integration is the fact that your shadow is endless. And so if you don't do this type of work with a clear intention and with a direct heading, you could just get lost looking around at stuff in there and just get stuck navel gazing for the rest of your life and never really move forward in any way. So what I help people do is I help figure out, okay, what is all this in service of? Like, what's the point of doing this in the first place? What kind of life do you want to create? And then once we know what kind of life they want to create, you have to create the identity. It's like, okay, so what type of person lives this life effortlessly? It's like, great, cool. You've got the vision. You've got the identity. Now it's a matter of what parts of you tell you that you can't have this vision or shouldn't have this vision. And what parts of you tell you that you can't be this person or shouldn't be this person. And then why? And then once we know where you're going and who you want to be and who in your mind is telling you not to be that, 
then we can figure out why they're saying that. And then it's a matter of just applying those lessons, meeting those needs, releasing a lot of that pent up energy. And then you just naturally end up becoming the person who can execute on that vision without having to think about it. Mm. What are some sort of specific exercises or techniques that people do with you in that process? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't really honestly do a whole lot of exercises. Most mm -hmm. of it's done through conversation and mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. asking questions. Um, but I'd say probably the biggest exercise or little piece of practicum I could use, I actually stole from EFT. Mm -hmm. And it's this kind of mantra style where it's like, you kind of do it, even though I feel this, I choose to believe this, or I choose to see myself in the world this way. What's an example of that? Yeah. So it's like, once somebody knows, like for an example, for me, like, because I was so afraid of abandonment, I would always push people away. Mm -hmm. And my way of dealing with that was like, okay, so there's this part of me that's pushing people away because he's afraid of abandonment. It's like, cool. It's like, okay, even though this part of me is terrified of abandonment, I'm going to love and accept myself and allow people to get close to me and know that I can take care of myself, even if they leave and know that it's okay and natural for people to leave. And so a big part of it is just honoring how you already feel while you choose the new belief. Hmm. And that's, that's a really big piece of it because people like will do things like affirmations all the time, but all that ends up doing is creating an internal conflict hmm. where they'll be like, I'm afraid of letting people in. And so instead of honoring that, they'll be like, I let everybody in and I trust everybody and everything's great. But then there's other parts like, no, the fuck you don't like stop hmm. it. And then you end up creating a conflict because this part of you is it's attached to your survival drive. And so you're not going to be able to silence it. It's just going to get as loud as it needs to get. And so if you can just say like, yes, I am a friend. You are right. I acknowledge you. I validate you. I care about you. I love you. You're absolutely right. People leaving sucks. So the best way for us to deal with that is you tell me if you see any red flags that make me think that this is a flaky person who's going to abandon me for no good reason. I'll listen to those red flags. And if no red flag comes up, and if this person does end up leaving anyway, then I'll just be here to love and take care of you. Mm -hmm. And so that honoring the way these different parts of you actually feel while working with it and choosing something new, that's probably the biggest thing that I do. And most of the time that's done through questioning. It's just like, okay, well, what's the pattern that you're trying to deal with? Okay, why does that pattern exist? And what is this part of you afraid of that's creating the pattern? What does it need to hear from you? What does it need from you? Because there's also um, emotional needs and practical needs, which is something that I teach as well. And the emotional needs are things like love and validation and care um, and all that sort of stuff. And then the practical needs are things like boundaries or difficult conversations, or maybe even walking away from a relationship, standing up for yourself, things that actually need to be done in the real world in order for these different parts of you to truly trust that you care, hmm. that you actually are looking out for them. because just giving love and validation and care and support without action will never build trust. Mm. You have to do both. And like just doing the actions without giving the love and the care, that part of you will never feel safe enough to relax. So you'll end up taking the actions for the rest of your life. So it really has to be a balance between giving love, care, appreciation, respect, understanding, and all that sort of stuff while actually taking the actions like setting a boundary or moving away from somewhere or standing up for yourself or whatever it is you need to do in order to actually create a sense of trust and have these parts be able to look through your eyes and be like, no, he cares. He's, mm -hmm. he's doing the thing we need him to do. I can trust this guy. Or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I could imagine, like certainly this happens with affirmations, but even with the same words that you're finding that you're kind of saying, I could imagine those like really falling flat and being like, well, that's nice words, but... Uh, like when I heard you say those phrases, it's like really um, partially because of the way you're setting it up of like, even though this is true and so on, but the, just the, there was something in you saying it's like very believable and trustworthy that like sort of sounds different to my ears. And uh, hey, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, I'm really appreciate you saying that because that's, that's a skill that you can develop and you can use your own intuition because like we were saying earlier, it's like you, you're going to know if you're lying to yourself. You're going to mm -hmm. know if you're being insincere. And there's what I, what I like to tell my clients is that like you have to use your own somatic experience as your guide. Mm -hmm. And so if the way that you're relating to something creates a sense of softness and creates a catharsis, 
then you can trust that you're probably being sincere and this part of you trusts you and is, and is melting. But if what you're saying causes it to hide or constrict or get tighter or angry, it's like, okay, I'm probably being performative right now. I'm probably lying. Or there's another part of me that's getting in the way that I need to deal with. Hmm. But yet you, you can hone that sincerity over time by just practicing. Hmm. That's really interesting because, um, so one of the things I do is I, I teach loving kindness meditation and certainly practice it a lot myself. And this sort of thing comes up a lot where like, you don't have to practice loving kindness with phrases, but that's one way of doing it. You can also use images or other things, but um, a lot of times like there's people using phrases, the phrases will seem hollow or um, uh, even um, bring up triggering things where it's like, yeah, I have resistance to this. And I always wonder about this because like for me, some people will say with this sort of thing, like, oh, fake it till you make it. We're like, keep going. And, you know, I think there's a wisdom in that actually, which is kind of what you're pointing out just now of like, oh, practicing, right? There is a virtue to keep practicing loving yourself and others. But I think what you're talking about with inner conflict and like parts of you not believing the thing, like if you just sort of bypass that or push past it or force past it, then that's, that's where it's not so good. And I, yeah, I'm just, that's sort of crystallizing for me hearing you talk about it, that like, there's two sides of that, of, um, you know, keep practicing, but also don't, don't force it or um, ignore parts of yourself that are in conflict with the thing that you're trying to do. Totally. And, and I think you're, you're already pointing to this, but there's a big distinction between fake it till you make it and know that you don't actually have any idea what the hell you're doing and be open to learning. Right. Because like, I didn't fake it. Like mm -hmm. I did in the beginning until I realized how much that didn't work. And then I had to humble myself and be like, okay, I actually don't get this. Mm -hmm. but I'm willing to learn. Mm -hmm. So let me just try this, see how it feels. It's like, no, that hurts. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously not going to work. Mm -hmm. So let me see what I did that caused it to hurt. And it's like, okay, because all of it makes sense. When, when you think about it from a human perspective, it's all very intuitive. Mm -hmm. Like people don't like to be pretended. Like if I were, if you had a person in your life who was loving you just because if you felt loved, you would get, they would get stuff from you. It's mm -hmm. like, you want that person anywhere near you. Like, yeah. You feel disrespected. And so it's the same with our internal shit because you're just a person. And so that leads to this other really big realization that you're both the giver and the receiver of all of your own attention. Mm. You have to tune into the part of you that receives your own attention and see what that feels like and then mm. modulate from there. Mm. You said earlier that um, the way you work, you see as like related to other modalities, but sl slightly different in certain ways. And I wonder if you could speak to the differences that you see between what you're doing and, and other things that are out there um to i, I can on a shallow level because mm -hmm. to be fully honest i haven't studied a whole lot of other models mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so the one i originally started learning was called voice dialogue mm -hmm. uh, i read only half a book on it which is where i got some of the main concepts i'd have this sufficing attitude my friend calls it where it's like i i learn as much as i need in order to start practicing and then i go practice and mine differentiates from this one in a really big way, because this is one of those, um, which is really powerful. I've had this facilitated for me before, where you'll have a facilitator and you sit in a chair and then there's like a bunch of other chairs in the room and each of the other chairs are for all of your different parts. And so when a different part is talking, you talk to, you sit in a different chair and then they have these cross things and whatever. And it's really powerful. And I got some cool breakthroughs with it, but it's like, you're reliant on the facilitator um, it's really kind of bizarre to go through. It's very hard to self-facilitate something like that. And I was dead broke at the time. So I didn't, and there were no facilitators in my area that I've ever. Of. And so even if there were facilitators, I couldn't afford them. So I had to come up with a way that I could do in my head that I wouldn't need a facilitator for, and that would work. And so I just kind of bottom lined some of the points. It was like, okay, in order to, to validate a part of you, you don't need that facilitated. In order to love a part of you, you don't need that facilitated. In order to figure out what this part of you is needing, you don't need that facilitated. I could just ask myself. Hmm. And so I just kind of, I wanted to make it much more practical and I wanted to make it more of something that I could use myself at any moment of any day. And so I just kind of took the main purpose of it and applied it to my needs and my desires. And so that's how my mind differentiates from that. And the only other one that I know a little bit about um, that I know is similar to mine is uh, IFS, internal family systems. And again, that's just structured in a way that I wouldn't structure mine. Like they have names for all the different parts and 
all those certain things, but I don't find that to personally be necessary. It's not that it's a bad model. It's a wonderful model that can really help people learn a lot of things. But for me, I don't need to know what a part is, how old it is. I don't need to know its name. I don't, I don't need to know any of that stuff. All I need to know is what kind of attention do you need from me? Mm. How can I best meet your needs? What can I do for you? And how do we become friends? That's mm. all I ever needed to know. And it's, it's age. It's none of that stuff that comes from IFS ever helped me get that information. I could mm. always get a straight line being like, all right, who are you? What are you causing in my life? What would cause you to create those patterns? And how can I help you to find a healthier, better way of life? Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you, as you're helping people with this sort of thing, do you keep an eye out for any kind of red flags that things might not be going well, or they might be hurting themselves, or are there any sort of failure modes or traps people run into that you see? Uh, the most common one is overwhelm, hmm. um, because people can get excited about this sort of stuff. And it's really important for people to go at their own pace. Hmm. And your, your mind will, will let you know that you're, you're hitting a wall and that you're hitting past your capacity because you start to get overwhelmed. Maybe you get anxious. Maybe you get scared. Maybe you start to shut down. Maybe you dissociate. Like, like your mind and your body will give you a lot of information that lets you know that this is happening. But sometimes people who are just like, I really want to get better now, like they won't take those signs and they'll keep going. Hmm. And nothing too crazy happens. Like they just get overwhelmed for a few days and maybe they get like depressed for a few days and they, they get destabilized for a little while, but then I'll coach them back into it and be like, yeah, okay, this is why I told you to pace yourself because this is what happens. Like you are playing with, you know, a delicate process here. And so you really want to make sure that you're being nurturing with yourself and, and going at a pace that you can sustain without destabilizing you because you still got to pay your bills and you still have relationships to uphold. And so you can't be the fucking just like dissociated mess in your bed all day. Like you got to be, you know, be taking care of yourself. Um, that's the biggest problem I've ever come across. Um, but it's really easy to, to notice because people will be like, wow, I feel really shitty after our session. It's like, okay, well, what did you do afterwards? And they'll be like, well, I, I did, I went into more and more. It's like, okay, well, I, I told you not to do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's, it's pretty easy. You just tell people to take care of themselves, drink a lot of water, maybe go on a run, um, something like that to help them get them restabilized. And then they kind of learn the lesson. So nothing too crazy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, but a big part of that is, um, I'll say this, a big part of that is my own intuition of knowing what to poke into and what not to poke into. Because there's certain things that it's like, okay, that feels really big. If we go into that, you're not going to be able to hold that. So we're, mm -hmm. we're going to stay, we're going to not go in there yet. And instead, we're going to look at how afraid you are of that thing. And now we, once we've dealt with how afraid you are of that thing, and once how potentially we've dealt with how potentially overwhelming that thing is, and we've built your capacity up to the point where we can look at that thing. Now let's just acknowledge it, see how that feels. Now that you've touched it, how's it feel? Because hmm. as soon as you touch a thing, it shoots a bunch of energy. It's like a little kid, little you know, like little kids that nobody ever listens to, hmm. and then finally they get you alone and they just don't shut the fuck up. It's it's like that. So like there's this little kid that has all these things to say and no one's ever listened to him, and so finally it's like, hey, I'll listen to you, and it's just get blasted. And so you have to be really careful about like, at first it's just like, Hey, and then if they unload, it's like, you, you might have to take a few hours to deal with what they unloaded. And then after that, it's like, you really just inch your way towards it. So it's really all about pacing. Hmm. I'm curious about that because, um, you know, people that are working with you directly would have the benefit of your intuition, but you know, you didn't have that when you were doing this stuff yourself. And then presumably there are people also doing this work on their own and like what are what are some of the sort of signs or indicators of oh this is way too big right now we need to like deal with the other thing first and then acknowledge this and so on like what, what do you notice in people that um signals that for you yeah so um a really big one is let's see so i need to think for my because I, I it's become intuitive for me so i haven't steered a client in anything that was too big for them in a very 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 long time mm -hmm. So, but when I was learning, it was things like, because I was really depressed at the time. So it was difficult for me to tell the difference between my normal depression and overwhelm that I was triggering from doing too much shadow work and, and waking up monsters I wasn't ready to face yet. 
Mm-hmm. So in the beginning, I just thought it was my normal depression. You know, like I, I was used to being in bed for days at a time. I didn't think much of it. But then as I started to getting healthier and I started feeling better, I was like, why am I, I'm not depressed anymore. Why am I still stuck in bed? And I was like, oh, because I'm triggering so much. And I was kind of masochistic at the point because I just wanted to get better, you know? So I was like, just bring it all on. Like I'll face as much as I can. And then I realized that that was actually kind of working against me and I, that I was actually capable of doing a lot more. I was just waking up so much unconscious emotion that it was actually becoming a detriment to me. Mm-hmm. So I had to kind of intuitively go in there and feel through it. Okay, so like, here's what I want to do today. Here's what the kind of life I want to build. How do I need to relate to these unconscious emotions so that they don't deregulate me and so they don't stop me from doing what I need to do? And so I would notice there was a point at which I was doing my work where I would start to feel overwhelmed or I would start to feel anxious or I'd start to feel destabilized. And for me, that immediately, because I wanted to start getting shit done, that occurred to me as like, okay, stop, like start caring for yourself, distance yourself from what happened, like thank whoever's there for being present and showing you what they showed you. But now go get a drink of water, go on a walk, go spend time with friends, go do whatever you need to do to, to reground and re-regulate yourself. And then once your capacity is expanded, you know, the next day you can go in a little bit more. So for me, it was, it was really just trying to get myself out of depression and realizing that there was things, there was ways I could relate to myself that would make depression worse. And then if I was just more loving and kind and patient with myself, my depression would incrementally get weaker and weaker and I would be capable of more and more as time went on. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that just kind of translated into like doing that for my clients. That makes sense. You spoke earlier about like that loving these parts that come up that it seemed like what they need is like partly acknowledgement of like, yeah, I see you. This makes sense. Validation of their feelings or perspectives. And then also like acting on the wisdom or needs that they have. And um, some of that stuff seems like, I, I don't know, like I've had to make like object object level changes in my life, like start something, leave something, you know, whatever. Um, but you also talked about boundaries and I would be really curious to hear how you think about boundaries and uh, how you help the people you work with establishing good boundaries and that kind of thing. Great. Yeah. Um, that was actually one of the biggest things I had to learn early on. Cause I told you the story where I was having these like thoughts about killing my girlfriend mm-hmm. and it was scaring the shit out of me because I didn't mm-hmm. feel like that type of person. And so I realized that it was actually all of that rage had built up because I wasn't setting boundaries mm-hmm. because I wasn't standing up for myself. And so her and her friends had grown accustomed to the idea that they could just kind of walk all over me and they didn't have to be nice to me in certain areas. It Mm. didn't matter because I wouldn't stand up for myself. So who fucking cared? And so that's what made my my rage build up to the point where I was like, okay, I'm just going to kill this. I'm going to get out of here. And so to me, I was like, wow. Okay, so that's the important, that's the importance of boundaries. It is because they, they protect your mental health. Like your boundaries are the things it's like, okay, every, this stuff doesn't get to go beyond this point because of this behavior of this energy of this attitude of this person goes beyond this point, it's going to start to negatively impact me. Mm-hmm. And so this is my boundary for how far this particular thing or circumstance or person or energy is allowed to get close to me before it starts to create negative impacts on my life. And so again, I had to use my intuition to kind of feel through every person in my life and be like, okay, how close can you be before you start to cause problems? It's like, okay, you can be that close. Okay, you can be this close. It's like, okay. And so I'm just kind of fine tuning boundaries depending on like, okay, I, you can be really close because you're actually good for me. So I want you close by. Cool. You're good. But you seem to only cause problems. So you need to be over here. And so for me, that really kind of defined my relationship with values in a really healthy way to let me understand what they're for and what happens when they're not held and how quickly your mind state can can deteriorate when you have people constantly crossing your boundaries or if you don't even have any. And so with my clients, I like to kind of figure out like, okay, like, so there's this person or this thing that's causing you pain in your life. How far away from you does it need to be? And, And most importantly, what is true for you to say about this that's the most important thing because a lot of times we don't have boundaries because there's something we don't want to be honest about Mm -hmm. like i didn't want to say hey you're hurting me i don't like i don't want to stand up for myself because i thought people would leave me i thought they would abandon me and so for me in order to start standing up for myself i had to face the reality that like yeah that will make some people leave 
Mm -hmm. Like once I stand up for myself, there's going to be people that don't like it. Mm -hmm. So what do I want to do about that? It's like, well, fuck those people. If I set my boundaries and you have a problem with me and my boundaries and doing what I need to do to take care of myself, well, then the boundary is you need to get the fuck out like entirely. And to me, that just made common sense. That just made sense. So when it comes to boundaries, it's like, what's the thing you're not saying and why are you not saying it? And then once you say it, how does the person respond to it? And that kind of tells you everything you need to know. So like if somebody's bullying you and you say, hey, you know, I, I don't like the way you talk to me. Like, it doesn't feel good. I don't want to be talked to that way. That's the thing that wasn't being said that needs to be said. And then based on how the person reacts to it, if they say, oh, wow, I didn't know I was hurting you. I'm, I'm really sorry. Thanks for telling me. Like, I, I want to do better. And it's like, cool, that person can come in a little bit more. But if that person gets all gaslighty and like, yo, blah, 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 starts complaining, whatever, it's like, cool, you've just told me that now you're one of the people that needs to go over here. And so I just kind of help people figure out like what's happening. What are you not saying about it? What needs to be said? What's keeping you from saying that? How do we deal with all that? And then once you can say it, we'll, we'll deal with, with the consequences of that. Hmm. What are some examples of boundaries you've had to set yourself over the years? It's a good question. Um, a lot of it has come from old friends hmm. um, because I was a pretty troubled guy in high school. And so most of the people that I knew in high school or growing up, um, they have not become the most well put together people, let's say that. A lot of them are either alcoholics or junkies. A lot, some of them joined gangs. Um, we were all really messed up in high school and I'm one of the only ones that ended up turning his life around. Hmm. So boundaries for me were just like, hey, you know, like I, I really love you. Like a good friend of mine, I won't say his name in case he watches this, but a good friend of mine, we used to like play video games together and he'd become an alcoholic. And so I didn't spend time with him, but I really loved him and I cared about him. And so we would still play video games together, but he would end up being so drunk that like, he just like couldn't play the game. And so I was like, okay, well then we can't really play together anymore. Hmm. And that's a real easy one, but it's tough when you love the person. Like that's the hardest thing about setting boundaries with people that you love. You, you love them and you try to help them and you try to be the helping hand and you try to accept and love them. And once you realize the behavior just isn't gonna change. And if you don't distance yourself from it, it's gonna start to impact you negatively. And no matter how much you love the person, you still just have to do what you have to do to take care of yourself. Absolutely. Um, and that's a very, very, very difficult thing for me to do um, mm -hmm. because I had this fear of being a bad person, all that sort of stuff that leaving somebody to their suffering when I know that like under the right conditions, I could be the one to help them through it. Mm. But having to honor the fact that those conditions aren't currently being met. And so there's nothing I can do because it's like, yeah, if, if he wanted help, I could have helped him. Like I could have been the guy to do that. But if you don't want help, there isn't anything I can do. And if you're just suffering and, and in a downward spiral that you're not trying to get yourself out of, eventually you're going to take me with you. Mm. And so the only thing I can do is distance myself from that. Mm. And if you ever need my help, I'll be there. But for now, I can't let you take me with you. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a lot of things like that because that's unfortunately been most of the people that I knew from my childhood and from high school have gone down paths similar similar to that so those have been some of the biggest boundaries I've had to set um, and same with you know clients you know like people that uh, can't afford my rates you know will want free stuff and they'll want discounts and in the beginning I really wanted to do that but it's like I don't have the time and if I want the life that I want to live and if I want to be able to be the type of person that can financially support and help those around me then I can't be the type of person that needs financial support. And so I have to hold these boundaries. Like I, I, and, I, and I've had to deal with that in ethical ways that feel good to my conscience. And so it's like, okay, if you can't afford me, it's like, cool. But what you can do is send me questions and then I will make a video on it or I'll write a post about it or I'll do a live about it to make sure that even the most broke person in the world can still benefit from my work. It can still be indirectly coached for me, even if they can't afford the coaching, you know, itself. So it's, it's been a lot of things like that. Um, nothing too crazy. I've, I've been very lucky that since I started doing this, I haven't had too many crazy people in my life. I've had to set really big boundaries with mm. um, family, you know, um, my brother's very different from me. So sometimes I, I get into issues with my brother, but usually it's just, very lovingly tell people how they're impacting you and most of the time they care and it's fairly easy to deal with. Hmm. 
Are there any difficulties you see your clients running into with setting boundaries? Um, let's see. Difficulties. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing is because it's interesting. Like I, I didn't realize this before I got started, but as you get into coaching, you end up attracting clients that have the same problems you do, mm -hmm. which is fascinating. But it's also I'm very grateful for it because if it were any other way, I, I don't know that I'd be able to be as useful as I am. Mm -hmm. But because people generally tend to come to me with problems that I've already dealt with, uh, standing up for yourself and boundary setting ends up being one of them commonly. And so a lot of times for people, the most of the time, people that don't want to set boundaries don't want to be seen as the bad guy. Most of the time they're people pleasers and they get something out of being people pleasers. And uh, nowadays that seems like most people in general are people pleasers, especially in the transformational spiritual community because they want to be the good guys. They don't want to ever be seen as the bad guys. And so the biggest part of boundary setting for my clients and for myself as well is being willing to let people see you as the bad guy is being willing to let people get mad at you and being willing to let people leave if they need to. And most importantly, being okay with how that makes you feel. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I set a boundary that I know is reasonable because I've done my soul searching around it. I know this is what I need. This is who I am. This is what I want. You now hate me because I've done something that I know I needed to do for myself. And so I know I've done something good and yet I feel like a bad person. Mm -hmm. And so like that dichotomy and that paradox is a, a lot of the time the hardest part for people. And so that's a lot of time what I help people work through is like, yes, you did the thing you know you needed to do and you feel like a bad person. It's possible to do the right thing and feel like a bad person at the same time. Hmm. And that polarity, that internal polarity and that internal juxtaposition of these really opposing emotions can be the hardest thing for people to make peace with. But once they understand that you can that you can feel opposing emotions at the same time, a lot of times that alleviates most of the stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I know that comes up for me, so I appreciate tough. you talking about that. Yeah, it's tough. Like, it's tough to feel like you're the bad guy. Like I said, I just broke up with my girlfriend two months ago, mm -hmm. and I knew I needed to do it, and I have felt like such an asshole. Mm. I felt like the because I've never done that. You know, like, because my pattern before this was to always just like wait until the girl couldn't stand me anymore and she had to break up with me because I didn't want to be that guy. Mm. But I didn't want to do that because that takes a long time and it takes a lot of energy and you can lose a lot of yourself in that process. And so I wasn't willing to go through that again. So this time I broke the cycle and did it myself. And man, it was hard. It's hard to, to, watch somebody that you love go through pain and know that like to some level you caused it mm -hmm. to feel terrible about it and know that you're doing the right thing anyway and to just not collapse into that feeling of like fuck i did this like i'm such a bad person it's just like mm -hmm. yep, i feel awful and terrible and i did the right thing and i have to stick with it and i'm, and I'm gonna follow it all the way through mm -hmm. what gives you that confidence that you will follow through with that when it feels so awful um because i've done it a million times before Mm -hmm. um you know like i've like that initial thing of feeling like being afraid that i was gonna like kill people like once you go through <laughs> the biggest thing that you're afraid of like nothing really scares you after that point right and once you face your biggest fear and you realize that you can turn your biggest fear that almost had you kill yourself once you realize you can turn that into a source of power then it's like, like i'm not really worried anymore it's mm -hmm. like, what's going to happen? Like, I'm going to feel sad for a long period of time. Like, okay, great. Like, I'm going to feel bad. Like, great. All that's going to do is turn into power later on. So like, bring it on. Like, I will feel bad. I will feel whatever I need to feel because I, I know that if I just stick with it, I'll become a stronger, better person as a result of that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just so curious, like how you, you mentioned at like 12, you started to believe that and that was like a mainstay for you. And like, do you remember how that came up for you at, at that age? Uh, I remember sitting and writing because I was a writer. Um, I write now and I've, I've been writing a similar type of stuff to what I write now since I was in like seventh grade. Hmm. And um, I had like a blog on MySpace and shit. And it was basically all the same stuff that I write now, but I, I didn't know what shadow integration was. So it was mm -hmm. from a more shallow seventh grade perspective. Mm -hmm. But I remember sitting there writing and I was like, you know what? Like, because I was inspired by Buddha because I mm -hmm. started researching other religions. And one of the things I really liked about the story of the Buddha was that 
one of the major points of his whole story is he's just some guy. Mm -hmm. The whole point is that if he can do it, you can do it. Mm. And so I was like, well, yeah, that's true. Like, he's just some guy. He got fed up with his life in a, in a palace and decided to go out and find his own way of life. And that's what he did. And he became the fucking Buddha. Now he's got one of the biggest religions in the world. So like, cool. <laughs> if he can do that, why can't I do that? So I'm going to go do that. And so I just started exploring, started writing it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to figure shit out on my own. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to figure it out. And it was a lot of trial and error. And I, just, I got myself into some really tough spots, but I always trusted that whatever was going on, I'd be able to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I had that trust. I think it was honestly, now that we're talking about it, I think it was because I would refuse to let myself feel weak. Mm -hmm. So I just stubbornly and bullheadedly insisted that I could figure it out. Because hmm. I wouldn't allow the thought that I couldn't. Hmm. I imagine that that's not the same thing that's motivating you these days. No, no. Now I'm fully okay with my limitations. I'm fully okay with where I'm weak. I'm fully okay with where I'm vulnerable. That's not it at all. Um, and it was a bit of a difficult shift to go from like being motivated by like, I will not be weak. I will not let the world beat me. I will not be destroyed. Like, cause there's a lot of power in that, but it's not mm -hmm. a strong, so, solid foundation to stand on. It's, it's, it's a dirty a, fuel. Yeah. It's, it's, it's based in terror and, mm -hmm. and the world will break. If, if you hold it with that much tension, it'll shatter. And that's exactly what happened. To me. And so I had to find something more motivating. And, um, and I still kind of use fear to a certain degree, but in a healthier way, because mm. I, I have the, uh, unfortunate but also fortunate experience of knowing what it's like to lose decades of my life to mental health problems hmm. and so i'm intimately and viscerally aware of that reality hmm. that if you do not tend to your garden and if you do not program your mind and tell it where to go and what to do it will do stuff on its own and almost guaranteed you're not going to be happy with what it does on its own hmm. and so for me because my whole internal system was just wrecked i was like okay if i don't hardwire this to go in the direction of my choosing it's going to go in a direction that is bad for me mm -hmm. and i was really afraid of the direction it would go if i wasn't steering the ship mm -hmm. and so a big part of my motivation was like i refuse to go there mm -hmm. like, i know that if i just let my unconscious steer i'll go in that direction and i refuse to be that guy instead mm -hmm. i choose to be this guy that's who I'm going to be. I don't give a fuck. Like if everything's impermanent, if I'm going to die anyway, if all this bad shit's going to happen and there's nothing I can do about it, I might as well be doing what I want to do the most. Hmm. Like if people are going to hate me no matter what I do, they might as well hate the version of me that I like the most. Hmm. If hmm. bad shit's going to happen to me no matter what I do, I might as well be the guy with enough money to take care of it. If all the relationships that I lose, if, if I'm going to lose every relationship, either to, to death or to sickness or to personal differences, if that's a guaranteed, I might as well love and appreciate the people that I have in my life while I have them. Hmm. So hmm. it's like this, this fear of everything that came from losing my dad ended up being a huge motivation for me once I integrated it because it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm going to fucking die. So I better live every moment with everything that I have. I'm going to lose everybody. So I might as well love them as much as I can. Bad shit's going to happen. So I need to be wealthy enough to take care of it. And so it went from this thing that I was terrified of to something that's like, yeah, you're right. Those are real problems. What's the best way to deal with those problems? Hmm. Best way I could figure it out was to be loving and confident and bold and courageous and wealthy. And those seem to be the best way to solve all the problems as best I can while still knowing that there's shit I can't do anything about. Hmm. It seems like, yeah, part of that too that you talked about is like almost like a playful or experimental mindset of like, oh, what's happening and what can I do about this and trying things and learning from that. And I think that's a quality that, um, oh, how to put it, isn't always present for people when they explore different modalities. And I think especially if you are exploring a modality that's like already made or that you have someone helping you with where like I mean you you it sounds like the image I get now is like you like sort of like pinned against the wall and you're like I have to find my way out of this somehow and I'm on my own and like okay. then you found that for yourself and I wonder what um 
how to ask this question. I, yeah, it's almost it's almost something like what would you tell someone who just doesn't have that virtue or quality where they like haven't really figured something out for themselves? Like how would you help someone else practice that? Yeah. So, cause it's interesting because I know what you're talking about where people be like, okay, I'm learning a modality. So I want to do the <laughs> modality right. Yeah. And that always ends up causing problems uh -huh. because it creates that sense of inauthent inauthenticity that we talked about before. Mm. So I'll have clients that'll be like, you know, like I, I said the thing and like, it, it didn't help. It made me feel worse. Uh -huh. Okay, well, like you said, I'm pretty robotic. Uh -huh. Do you actually care about this part of you that you're talking about, or are you just checking shit off of a list? Right. And a lot of times they'll be like, well, I'm just going through the motions. I was like, okay, well, just think about what that would be like. You're hurt, you're scared, you're upset, and there's only one person in the entire world, in the entire universe, who could listen to you in a way that could actually help. Hmm. And when you try to tell this person what's going on, they feed you some canned bullshit response that somebody told them to say. Hmm. How would you feel? And they're like, oh, well, that feels terrible. It's like, okay, well, that's what you're doing to yourself. What do you think would work better? I'm like, well, I just want to be listened to. I just want to be cared about. I just want to be loved. And I don't just want someone to care about what's happening with me. Like, okay, can you do that? And they're like, well, yeah. It's like, okay, go do that then. Because <laughs> uh -huh. most of the time, they're just missing that living relationship. Because we're not trained to see are different parts of ourselves as living beings like people mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in fact we're trying to think that that's crazy that that mm -hmm. means you have did or something but it doesn't like we mm -hmm. all have a myriad of different voices in us and i don't know if they are people but they behave that way and so the, the biggest thing to get people into their intuitive practice is to give them that living relationship and to see like no this is a person this is you how would you want to be treated and then when you explain what they're doing and why it doesn't work, it's like, well, well, of course it doesn't work. You're being insincere. Like, think about what it would be like if somebody treated you that way. Mm. And then nine times out of 10, that, they'll just be like, oh, yeah, you're right. That sucks. Okay, I'm going to find a better way. Mm. And then that can start triggering the like trial and error experience. Mm. But also a lot of times people have that mentality because they have a different fear of getting it wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's like perfectionism because they're like, I have to get it right because if I don't get it right, bad things happen. It's like, okay, well, let's first help you face the fear of getting it wrong. And then once you're okay with getting it wrong, then you can have a more intuitive trial and error based practice. Mm -hmm. This is just a guess about your experience. So it might be, it might be wrong, but from hearing you talk about it, I'm guessing that there's something like even deeper than that, uh, which is like, like that, that seems, that seems like a big part of it, like respecting yourself basically, mm -hmm. uh, at, and the, the, the sort of people inside of you, but it seems like there's something maybe even deeper of like, um, any like a faith that any problem you face can be learned from and resolved yeah that's very much true i for some reason like i said before for some reason when when i when i heard this i took it as an absolute truth maybe it's because i needed to in order to feel like i had any stake in my future but i took it as an absolute truth that this formula and this way of relating to myself would transform anything and everything I ever came up with for the rest of my life. Mm. I don't know why I believe that so fervently, but I have yet to be proven wrong. Mm. And so I'm very glad that I was willing to, to go all the way on that belief mm. because I have literally never found anything I couldn't learn from, anything I couldn't integrate, no internal opposites I couldn't harmonize. I've never found anything mm -hmm. that I couldn't use this on. So how would you help someone who hasn't believed that to start to see things that way that's a good question because it's one of those things that like i don't know why i believed it uh -huh. I, I don't yeah. know what happened it's just like just same with like uh energy transmutation like i, I just read about it and i was like oh that's a thing like i'm gonna uh -huh. do that i'm gonna figure that out so sometimes these things just go off in my head and i'm like yeah that's real let's figure that out but for people who don't have that um i like to give them either i explore why they don't already believe that and a lot of times is it comes up to a self-trust thing mm. and they don't trust themselves to follow through on stuff. They don't trust themselves that this thing could ever be better. They don't trust themselves for a myriad of different things. And so we explore where the lack of trust comes from. And once they deal with that, then they're at least willing to experiment and see what happens. Mm. And once they're willing to experiment and see what happens, then to kind of walk them through something really simple, you know, like, um, what's the easiest way to explain this? So there's, there's an energy epicenter behind every pattern. 
Hmm. There's somewhere that each part of you lives. Hmm. And so like, let's say the part of you that pushes people away lives in your heart. Hmm. And if we find that, then we say, hey, you know, like, even though you're afraid of being abandoned, like, I'm always going to be here for you. And that's a simple and profound enough shift for them to see the truth of like, oh, wow, if I validate these things and treat them with love, they change. Hmm. And it's like, so I'm like, okay, so you felt that on a small level. All right. Now imagine that stretched out over the next 15 years of your life Hmm. with every single part of you feeling Hmm. more and more loved all the time, more and more included, more and more honored. Just imagine what would happen to this part of you. Imagine what would happen to your life. Imagine what would happen to your self-confidence. Imagine what would happen to your reality if this little thing that you just saw work in real time were to be practiced and developed over the course of the next 15 years. Mm. And normally mm. that's enough for people to be like, wow, yeah, okay, things probably be pretty different. It's like, cool, let's keep practicing it. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. It sounds like um, if I could reframe that, like it, it seems like you are very much holding that perspective. You've seen it to be true again and again in your life. And even if someone sees it totally differently, well, one, you, you like honor that and validate that and listen to that and learn from that. Cause that's, that's also like a problem that's in front of you of, of, totally. of a kind um, that's something that has to be seen and worked with. And then from there, like any step towards a positive direction is evidence of the view that you're holding so firmly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I just try to build evidence because, yeah, you're right. I don't even question it anymore. Mm-hmm. I haven't questioned it for a long time. Mm-hmm. I know that every single thing that comes up in my mind will eventually get integrated and it will become a, an ally and a source of strength and trust and, and wisdom. And so for me, I do proceed with that certainty. It's just a matter of what's the quickest way to prove it to you. Mm-hmm. Like what's the quickest way for me to show you mm-hmm. in real time that just a little bit of different input can has a, have a drastic input, impact mm-hmm. on the way you feel and, and think and see yourself. And then once they see that little bit, then it's just like, don't you want to keep going? Mm-hmm. And almost every time it's yes. And if I'm not mistaken, it sounds like you believe that not only with the thoughts and feelings within your own self, but also the circumstances that you find yourself in. Is that yeah, right? 100%. So if you I like thought- got terminal cancer right now, you'd be like, somehow I'm going to learn from this and be okay. And this is for the best or, or something to that effect. Yep. How, yeah. Like, what would that be like? If you imagine that like tomorrow you got news, okay, terminal cancer, I've got six months. Like, what would your, what do you, it's just a thought experiment. So we can't know for sure. But like, what do you imagine you would? First, I'd be yeah. devastated. Mm-hmm. First, I would, I would let myself fully have the experience. I would let myself despair. I would let myself get devastated. I would let myself rage. I would let myself go through the whole process. And as I went through the whole process conscientiously and and allowed things to to move through me and create some space, then as that space gets created, I would be finding ways for me to start installing positive frames and positive Mm -hmm. thoughts. And this is controversial, you know, but whatever, I'm, this is my opinion. I would think that something like cancer would ultimately be the result of a thought pattern. Hmm. And so for me, it's like, okay, I must have an anti-self thought pattern. Hmm. So I would want to look into what would be causing this pattern. And for me, the way I diagnose patterns is I look at how I feel as a result of the pattern having taken place. So whatever, I, whatever stories I tell myself about the bad thing is probably the same stories that caused the bad thing to happen. Hmm. So I would, because life is cyclical and our, and our emotions are cyclical. So whatever thoughts and feelings you're, you're using to create the pattern are the same thoughts and feelings that end up getting compounded and solidified as a result of the pattern. And hmm. so, which creates the pattern, self-fulfilling prophecy, and life just keeps kind of going like that. So if I got some really bad news, whatever it might be, I would, as I'm processing it, I'd be looking for the stories that I'm telling myself. I'd be looking for the context I'd be living in. I'd be looking for any identities that I'm affirming through the whole process. And as a result of looking for those things, I could probably parse together what thought and emotional patterns led to the problem in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then as I release and integrate those, I would probably either start to notice a shift in my symptoms or a shift in my attitude to where it's like, if I 
because I don't know what would happen, but if I genuinely thought I had six months to live, I would blow all my money and do the most ridiculous shit I could possibly imagine and just live out all of my fantasies and go out in a fucking blaze of glory. <laughs> but if I actually saw shifts in my, in my symptoms, which I, I assume I would, huh. then I would just go all in on that and do whatever I needed to do to get to the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense that it starts with really feeling the thing and, and going through it. And yeah. uh, yeah, the first thing you want to do in a moment like that is start to repress whatever you're going through and try to create a positive frame before you're done dealing with the impact. Right. That'll just lodge it in you and make it stronger. Mm -hmm. So um, we've talked a lot about shadow integration and uh, <clears throat> there's a tweet I want to ask you about that you wrote, I think about two months ago, where you said feeling kind of torn. Shadow integration isn't the most important thing to me anymore. It was only ever a means to an end. What I really want is to help people embrace the hero archetype and live like heroic individuals. Um, just, and then later you said, um, shadow integration is a means to an end. It's meant to help you become the best version of yourself. Shadow integration for its own sake is navel gazing. You can waste your life doing that. There's something bigger. Um, so there's a lot, a lot here. <laughs> Tell me about this and like how you help people get started with that part of the journey. Like, okay, you've done some of the shadow integration. Like, how do you steer them in the direction of becoming heroic individuals? So I actually start there, which is mm -hmm. why I do the vision and the identity. First. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm like, what are you fighting for? What's at stake here? And then this is also, I actually borrowed this from Jordan Peterson's self-authoring program, mm -hmm. so which does is He'll help you finalize your vision because I, I, I went through his program like in 2016 or something like that. And he'll help you define the vision. And then also have you clearly define what happens if you don't follow through. Hmm. So that's what I do in my courses is it's like, okay, where do you really want to go? And I borrowed another idea from uh, Nietzsche. It's called the organizing idea. And it's this idea that there's something so intrinsic, so naturally desirable to you that if you were to pinpoint it and fine tune it and actually identify it and articulate it, that it would be so powerful that your whole being and your identity and your worldview and your reality would start to revolve around it. And it would, you would or start to organize your whole life around whatever this thing is. Mm. And so when I help people create their vision and their identity, it's centered around that idea that there's a version of you that exists in the ether, but also blueprinted inside of you. And there's a life that you have a blueprint for inside of you that is so intrinsically exciting and worthwhile and meaningful that your reality and your identity and your psychology would naturally start to organize around it because you just want it so fucking bad. So what I try to do is I try to get people somewhere in that ballpark as soon as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to start doing shadow integration, it's going to get really scary and it's going to get really uncomfortable and it's going to suck. And so you need to have some light at the end of the tunnel telling you why it's worth it. Mm -hmm. When you're, cause there's that quote, I forget who it's from, but it's like, if you're going through hell, keep going. And a lot of times it can be really discouraging because it's like, like I'm going through a transition after this breakthrough or after this breakup where my mind's telling me that I'm the biggest loser on the planet. That's the best I'm ever going to have it. And I'm never going to mm. get anything better and blah, 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 blah. And it's really convincing and it's really scary, but I know who I am. I know where I'm going. I know what's on the other side of this. And on the deepest, darkest, scariest, most painful days, that keeps me going. Mm. And so having a meaningful vision and an identity and a version of yourself that you actually believe you can become that is inherently worthwhile helps motivate you through those really dark times because you're like, nope, I'm just in a process. I know that in order to, be, to get there and become that guy, I have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, so to speak. And I just have to keep going because I know that's on the other end of it. Hmm. And so having a really meaningful vision is the very first thing I teach in my courses. And from there, you have something that can carry you through the really dark, scary, hard times. Um, and I think that's, in my opinion, that's been the most effective way to help people get through all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things you talked about in that tweet was like, uh, you know, you could just, and I, I imagine this is coming from you saying like, oh, shadow work could be endless. Like there's no end to it. And you're like, oh, well, it's navel gazing if you just keep doing that. Like, do, is that something you see happen that some of- Hell yeah. 
Hell yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, especially in more uh, like spiritual communities. Because mm -hmm. people will get really excited about like doing the work mm -hmm. and they'll identify as people who do the work mm -hmm. and they spend all their time doing the work, but then their life still sucks. They're still mm -hmm. broke. Their friendships aren't good. They don't have solid romantic relationships. They're miserable and depressed. They live in some shithole. And it's like, your life isn't getting any better. Like, yeah, you're doing the work. And like, yeah, on paper, you're like a spiritual person, but like you're one disaster away from being completely fucked. Like you should be building a life for yourself. And that's my own personal opinion. There's a lot of other people who think differently, but it's my opinion that all of this should be in service of something, hmm. whatever that may be. You know, like even if you want to go pursue enlightenment like i'd rather pursue enlightenment from a comfortable home mm. you know like where if bad stuff happens i don't have to freak out about it like mm. that's my own personal preference and i think there has been a loss and a disconnection of personal meaning in people's lives mm. and you know this is you know back from to mention nietzsche again the whole idea that god is dead we lost our sense of meaning. We lost our sense of collective, like this is the world we're living in. This is what we're here for. This is what we're born to do. This is the rule. This is what is expected of us. We lost our sense of meaning and purpose in life. And it hasn't been replaced with anything. The only thing that's been close to being replaced with is like politics and sometimes spirituality, like doing the work. But what I like to show people is that like, no, like there's actually a life in you that wants to be created. There is a version of you that wants to come out and if you can identify what that is and work towards that and use your shadow integration to be in service of that, then you can have a really meaningful, satisfying, fulfilling, and wonderful life. Whereas if you don't have anything that you're aiming at, because I used to do this, and you could just spend all your days like just feeling a lot of pain and have it not be for anything. It's like, oh, great. I faced this big, scary thing. And like, great. I'm somebody who can do that. And like, cool. I, I guess that's a good skill to have. But if it's not in service of anything, it's like all you did was sat there and felt really terrible for a few days and nothing came of it. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, it's a waste because there's a life in each of us that wants to be lived. And I, I really just want to encourage everybody to live that life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so good once you start doing it. Like the, It feels so meaningful and satisfying and beautiful to be actually aware of the fact that you can create a reality that is tailor-made to you and for you and by you it's like fuck like that's i would hate to think that anybody just left that on the table mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i really want to encourage people to reach for that rather than just endlessly doing shadow work and, and picking themselves apart because this is hard it's scary it's painful and i would hate to think that people spend all their time doing all this really hard painful scary stuff and didn't even get anything out of it mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I really try to direct people there as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So somebody that you're working with has has some kind of vision and they're doing the work to, in, to like find and integrate their shadow. And how do you help them from that, you know, towards their vision? What does that look like? Yeah, so it's like identify the vision, identify the identity, mm -hmm. where you want to go, who you want to be while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And then if at all possible, take as many steps as you can. Mm -hmm. And then really only start integrating stuff once you have to. Mm. Once, once a problem has come up that either is stopping you dead in your tracks and not allowing you to continue or is causing problems mm -hmm. or subtly sabotaging you or maybe even sabotaging you in big ways, but just keep going until problems start to arise. And then once the problems arise, integrate the part of you that creates the problem and then keep walking. Mm. The idea is, Shadow integration is like, for me, something that I only do because I have to. Mm. Like if I could have just gone out and lived my dream life that was satisfying, fulfilling, <laughs> and aligned with my soul all the way through, I would have never learned this skill. Mm. But I had to learn this skill because I had emotional blocks and I had my psychology all messed up. And it was, it was not, I was not someone who was programmed for success. Like my brother makes millions and millions of dollars every year. My brother is programmed for success. Mm. He, he lives in a mansion and he has two supercars and he can pay for whatever the fuck he feels like. And my brother's programmed that way. I was not. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted the life of my dreams, I had to program myself to create it. Mm -hmm. So I only do that to the degree that I have to. Mm -hmm. 
Like if I can do the thing without having to do shadow work, I'll just go do it. But if I absolutely have to integrate a part of myself in order to either unlock a part of my brain that can think differently or to remove a block so that I can move more freely um, or whatever it may be, then I'll integrate whatever's in the way. But I'm always aimed at, at walking towards what I desire as quickly as possible. Mm, that makes sense. How do you know that you have integrated a shadow part? Mm, I love this question. Um, when you don't have to think about doing the good thing, hmm. you know, like, so what, one of my biggest vices is video games. I hmm. love video games because it was a big source of comfort for me when I was a kid, getting to escape into like, like Zelda was my favorite when I was a kid, like getting to escape into that world and, hmm. and be a hero and the music and the beauty and the environment. So it was a really wonderful escape for me when I hated my life. So for me, video games are a big source of comfort and probably my biggest vice. That and women, those are my two biggest vices. Hmm. And so I know, so I back up a little bit. Nobody has to tell me to play video games more than I should. Hmm. Nobody has to tell me to smoke more weed than I should. Nobody has to tell me to spend more time with women than I should. Nobody has to tell me to do that stuff. Hmm. Brain is just programmed to do it. Hmm. So when I take those patterns, and I program those same parts of myself to do something new, nobody should have to tell me. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. I, I do those other things because my brain is programmed to do that. So once I've changed the programming and my brain is now programmed to do something else, I shouldn't have to tell it to do that. That mm -hmm. should be a natural impulse. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I know something has been integrated when it no longer requires effort for me to inhabit a new way of being or to stick to a new pattern or to engage in, in my reality in a new way. When it comes natural to me and it's authentic and intuitive and I don't have to think about it anymore, I consider the thing integrated. Mm. That makes sense. I wanna um, ask you about, like you, you described your relationship with video games and women as a vice. And yet, you know, you just recently had this relationship. So I imagine it's not like, yeah, like how do you, how do you hold that? Why use the word vice? And how do you think about relationships? And what, what is it that's unhealthy and what is healthy for you? Yeah, so I, I use the word vice um, because the way I view the seven deadly sins mm. are things that, if taken to excess, could destroy your life. Mm. Mm. Any one of the seven deadly sins, if taken to excess, could completely destroy your life. Mm. And so I currently call them vices because I know that if I'm not disciplined, they have the capacity to do that. Mm. I, if left to the devices of certain parts of myself i would just play video games all day mm -hmm. like or at least more than i should way more than i should mm. i would be really unhappy with myself if i did it every day and the frustration would eventually get to me and i have to do something else but i would play them way more than i should mm. if just left to certain parts of myself and so i call them vices so that i can proceed with a sense of caution mm -hmm. and same with women you know like i was raised by a single mom and when I was in my dad died when I was a kid. So I got my comfort and I got my stability and I got a lot of really important needs met through my mom. Mm -hmm. And so as an adult, it's very easy for me to want to get those same needs met through women. Mm -hmm. My comfort, my validation, my care, my love, my feeling like I'm good enough. It's very easy to want to get those needs met from women. But that's a shitty road down to walk on. Mm -hmm. So I, I hold these things as vices. I don't see them as bad. You know, like I still play video games. Like I want to play video games today. Um, and I still love women. Like I, I don't have a problem with any of those. They're things. not intrinsically but, bad. <laughs> yeah, they're not intrinsically bad, yeah. but I hold them with a sense of caution because I know that for me, they pose a specific danger to the life mm -hmm. that I want to create. Mm -hmm. So if I don't hold them cautiously um, and intentionally and with discipline, then I run the risk of, of going down a path I, I don't like. Mm -hmm. Is, uh, with video games is the like sort of deadly sin there like sloth that you're yeah. indulging in yeah uh-huh so um and what's the the sort of sin that you're indulging with women like uh like just sex uh i, I, I forget I, that's not a frame i've thought about for so many years so i forget which i can look it up too but yeah so i guess it would like, be I guess lust. lust yeah it would be lust uh-huh yeah um you know because in all transparency i have equated sex with comfort i've equated sex with vulnerability or validation mm -hmm. and to a certain part of my mind that got my comfort and things from my mom 
it tells me that as long as women that I like want to have sex with me, then I'm okay. And I'm safe. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be all right. Mm -hmm. And so when times get tough, it can be real easy for me to just want that feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's no integrity in that. There's no strength in that. There's no, Mm -hmm. there's no real personal agency in that. It's just Mm -hmm. a little kid running to mommy and essentially turning this poor woman that never wanted to play this role into my surrogate mom and like mm. wants any part of that so i have to be really aware of that as a pattern and nurture myself when i notice that happen mm. and, and uh, well first off i really resonate with that definitely there so uh thanks for being vulnerable and uh sure. yeah that that's part of where i'm coming from it's like i definitely definitely yep yeah. so and and what um so i, I want to ask you a question about that but just sort of a prior question in order to be able to ask that question is yeah. what 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 is it that you were seeking or giving yourself through video games uh an escape really escape um mm-hmm. and i i haven't found the part of me that believes this but i'm tempted to believe that it's some kind of power fantasy as well huh see over uh, here hearing you talk about it I, I mean i'm not you so but over yeah. here it seems like I would have guessed before you answered that it would be more like a sense of purpose or meaning and that you're fitting that need through like your work and your life in other ways. But uh, well, I mean, that's the thing about it is like, because my work can be scary sometimes. Mm-hmm. Video games mm-hmm. are never scary. Mm-hmm. So I can get a sense of accomplishment. I can get a sense of, because I like to play hard games, you know, like I, I like to play fun games too, but a lot of times I play games for the challenge. Like I play games on hard mode and I play like specifically difficult games that I want to feel that success of like, fuck yeah, everybody in the world who plays video games says this is hard and I fucking did it. So yay mm-hmm. me, I'm amazing. I want that adrenaline and I want the dopamine and I want all that stuff. Um, but it's also an escape because I, for me, like world building and character design or like I design my own clothes. And so I'm, I'm really into world building and character design. And so, and I'm also a big fan of anime. And so if there's a world that I can get lost in, and just find beauty in it then like it's very aesthetically pleasing for me and i love getting lost in worlds and i love getting lost in characters and all mm-hmm. those sorts of things so there's there's a very real sense of escapism for me um and also there's the, the pushing myself and doing really difficult things because i'm also extremely competitive mm-hmm. um so playing games online i get to compete with people and mm-hmm. i get real objective feedback about who's the best and then like that pushes me forward and mm. playing hard games is cool because like i'll compete with my friends and mm. so i'm competitive it gives me um an escape and also it's just they, they make them addicting they yeah, make yeah. Them fun. sure <laughs> sure i imagine uh, you know you're using the word escape but i'm imagining underneath that there's a sense of like maybe numbness from feelings and then also like safety like you're not going to get hurt or uh you're protected from bad things that's an interesting one because it's like it never actually gives me any relief from my feelings mm-hmm. because what ends up happening is when i play a game longer like if i if i'm if i did what i needed to do that day mm-hmm. and i feel good and i set myself an allotted amount of time to play a game that i like and i play the game for that amount of time and i turn it off when i'm done i feel great i feel mm-hmm. good about it it's a fun mm-hmm. thing. It can even be a nice little pick me up in the middle of the day if I'm feeling lethargic. Mm-hmm. I'll go and get a win and I'll be like, boost me. And I'll be like, cool, <laughs> yay, everything's great. <laughs> but on the days where I know I should be doing something else, mm-hmm. it provides me no comfort. Mm-hmm. It provides mm-hmm. me no numbness. Mm-hmm. Instead, I'm locked in this experience of like, I shouldn't be doing this. Mm-hmm. Other things I should be doing, which turns into this like, low to mid-level anxiety in the back of my head and this like bro your life's passing you by like you know there's the two timelines the version of you that does what he wants the version mm-hmm. of you that fucks off like you're being the fuck off guy right now <laughs> like uh-huh. I can pick you what you want and i'm just like i just want to be safe uh-huh. i just want to be free yeah yeah I, I, yeah i imagine that's what you're looking for and and similarly like with women it's like you're looking for validation you're looking for love and care and so on and like those things are are like not sustainable sources of meeting that sort of thing so so yeah the the sort of like deeper question is knowing like with this kind of self-knowledge that you're like going to these things or these people for these like deep psychological needs how have you been able to meet those needs for yourself Hmm. uh that's a good question so one of the other things that i get from video games is adventure Hmm. really love adventure Mm -hmm. um i've traveled to 
not a million countries, but like I think seven different countries. I've gone to Burning Man a mm. bunch of times. I used to work on music festivals for like five years. So I've gone to dozens of music festivals. I used to be homeless. Um, so adventure is a really big thing for me. So like you said, um, it's meeting needs. And so the best thing I've, I, the best thing I've done for myself is identify what needs I'm getting met and then try to meet them in myself. So adventure, I try to go out and explore and do fun things and give myself a real sense of adventure. Um, also competitiveness. I compete in other areas. Like I'll, I'll, I'll compete with my friends who are like maybe making more money than me that month. Or I'll find other healthier ways to compete. Or I'll compete with myself in the gym. Um, cause I go to the gym every day. And so I'll compete with myself there instead. Um, or if it comes from an escape for me, if I need an escape, that probably tells me that I'm probably a little overwhelmed. Mm or I might be a little burned out and, or something's coming up because I always ask like, what do I need to escape from? Like, what am I escaping from? Like if, if I've created a really cool life, for me, why would I want to escape from that? So what the hell am I trying to escape from? And what am I trying to escape to? And a lot of times it's like, I've either been pushing myself too hard or pushing myself from a not loving and compassionate place. And so even if I'm getting a lot done, I don't feel like I'm being well taken care of. And so I, that part of me that just wants to be free and feel good, will find that release in a video game. And so a lot of times it's like, okay, I need to be nicer to myself. I need to ease up. Or maybe there's some really scary emotion associated with my work that I don't want to face. And so I'd rather get a cheap version of the same kind of satisfaction. So it's okay, let me face the scary thing so I don't want to run away from it anymore. Um, and then with women, Similar approach, but it's a little bit harder um, because as most of my clients point out, there's certain things you get from other people you just can't get from yourself. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. I used to go to strip clubs a lot hmm. because there's a certain kind of attention that a stripper can give you that most women just won't give you. Hmm. And unless you are good at inspiring that kind of attention and good at attracting the type of women that know how to give you that attention, which I finally am now, but for a while, it was difficult for me to get that kind of attention, that focused, attentive, like you are the king of the universe for these two songs. And I just want to give you all of my attention and energy and make you feel like the most special motherfucker on the planet. I didn't know how to generate that experience from women, so I paid for it. Hmm. And at the, I didn't really care because it was like I was getting my needs met and I had the money, so who gives a shit? But as I got older and wanted a more sustainable version of that, it, be, it, it started to be much more unfulfilling. And so I was like, okay, like what, how, it's like, I don't know how to generate this experience from real people yet. So how do I give it to myself? And I was like, okay, what do I want from this? I want to feel special. I want to feel important. I want to feel like I matter in those moments. I want to feel like I'm worthy of attention. I want to feel like I'm worthy of desire. I want to feel like I'm worthy of love. I want to feel like somebody cares enough to take them time out of their day to make me feel good and it's like okay well do i treat myself that way mm. well fucking no no mm -hmm. i don't so what can i do to not only treat myself that way but to treat the specific part of me that needs it the most mm. how do i treat him that way and so it's like well i need to love him mm. i need to acknowledge that he's in an emotional deficit and he's desperate to get his needs met to the point where he'll waste hundreds of dollars on girls that don't care about him to pretend like they do for 10 minutes. Hmm. And it's like, okay, like that's pretty alarming. Hmm. So let me look at this part of myself. Let me feel his pain. Let me care about him. Let me love him. And that worked for a little while, but it wasn't really enough. And so ultimately what I found out was that like these women were a source of light that I didn't have. Hmm. My light had been snuffed out by the loss of my father mm. i got so scared that i put my light away because I, I i didn't want to get hurt so i was like oh so they're they're a source of warmth for me that i don't have in my being so how do i generate a sense of warmth and that has been the biggest thing to break my dependency i guess you could say mm. because when you don't have an internal sense of warmth I didn't realize this until after I developed it, but it's like, man, the world is cold. The world is hard to deal with when you don't have an internal sense of warmth. Mm -hmm. And women are that. Women are the warmth. They're, they're, that's, why the, that's why all the, the muses in Greek mythology were all women. It's like, they're the inspiration. They're the warmth. They're the fire. They're the beauty. And if you don't have that in yourself, 
seeing it represented externally can be such a beautiful form of torture to make mm. you aware of what you don't have. And so once I started to find my own inner warmth, then it was like, I just didn't really need it from people anymore. And I mm. could engage with people in ways that felt good mm. and were healthy for me and, and didn't cause problems. How did you give yourself that sense of warmth? Oh, that's another good question. I don't know. Um, I just, it's one of those things. I just knew it was in there. Mm -hmm. So all I had to do was just like, okay, like I know it's in there somewhere. Some part of me is in charge of, of this. And the only reason I want it externally is because the part of me that would do it internally is, isn't there. He's, mm. he's, he's covered up by something. So what's covering him up? And it was again, same fears, hopelessness, despair, you know, not wanting to get hurt, not wanting to lose things. And so I was like, okay, well, great. I can face those things. And then as I did, I got curious about like, okay, where can the light come from? And then I just started to feel this little spark inside of me that felt really good. And as I paid attention to that spark, any like compulsive thoughts I had about women started to be more directed towards the spark. Hmm. And I was like, well, I can get, so like that compulsion isn't compelling anymore hmm. because what I want is right here. So let me focus on this. And the compulsion got less and less interesting. And this got more and more interesting. And as I focused on my own light, I started to just like do the things that I wanted to do and start having more fun and be the source of everything that I, I always tried to get from other people. Hmm. Hmm. I'm, I think, how about this? That, that seems like true, but it also feels very abstract. And I imagine that there are like specific things that you do to like really love yourself and really give yourself that warmth. And, and I might be wrong, but if, if you can think of any specifics, I'd be curious to hear them. It's just, it's just you're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm glad you're pointing to that. It's just hard to describe it sometimes because I don't think about it. Mm -hmm. It's just something that I just do. Mm -hmm. So it's like, again, it really comes down to how I relate to them and how they see them. Mm -hmm. Like the part of me that is like, you find a part of you that's holding the light, but it's so mm -hmm. scared to let it be seen it's like holy shit like you have the keys to the universe but you're just so hurt and scared that you won't use them it's like motherfucker come here like i am so sorry that you've been living in a world like that i'm so sorry that i've allowed you to live in a world like that so there's just this like natural care that when you really allow yourself to see the internal world for what it is for me anyway there's just this real natural care that takes over and when i find a part of me guarding something so valuable i just i think about what would drive someone to do that and it's just that knowledge alone just makes me want to give it an, an unlimited amount of love <laughs> and so as far as concrete stuff i i wish i had a better answer for this i really do but i that's literally it because also to be totally honest and transparent i used to do a lot of acid and i used to do a lot of mushrooms and one of my first mental breakdowns or one of my really big scary ones was because I started to like I can see my internal world like I can see all the different parts I can I can see the energy and how it intersects with other energies and when I first started knowing this I thought I was going crazy because mm. it was like I see stuff people don't see I see stuff you shouldn't be able to see I'm, I'm my world my internal world is alive in a way that I, I don't know how to deal with and so to me, I've always held that as something that I, I couldn't ever express, mm. that I'd never be able to explain to anybody. So I've kind of shied away from it. But you're, this question you're asking is, is the closest anybody's ever had to being like, hey, describe that thing. Mm. And I don't know how. And I'm mm. honestly scared to try. Mm. You're, you're scared right now. Yeah, I'm scared right now. Huh. Because okay. I first realized this skill and I thought I was going crazy. Mm. It took me over a year to realize that it was an asset. Mm. And so I was in a really, really dark time when I first realized this kind of awareness that I had before I realized that it was a gift. So it's actually really vulnerable to try and talk about because mm. I'm still holding it as like, this isn't normal. Mm. So I I've never said that to anyone before. And I didn't even realize that was the case fully, but you asked a very good question. And so mm. that's the best answer I have. Mm. Is this something that you'd like to keep talking about because uh, sure. I, I could ask about it but I don't want to push you either if it's no, scary. Good. I'm happy to well at least over here I mean I'm very curious about what you're talking about and also uh hmm, well it's my um how to be 
over here, I'm committed to loving you and being a loving, safe presence for seeing this part of you. And um, yeah, just how. Um, how did you start to notice this gift or skill? What was that like? What happened at that time? I was really scared, man. Mm -hmm. I was really scared. And I can feel the fear now. I've actually never talked about this before, but I was really afraid. I thought I'd lost my mind. Mm. You know, because I, I had I had a really bad mushroom trip the day I graduated high school. Mm. So you would have been like 18 or something like that? Yeah, I was 18. And the very day I graduated high school, me and my friends went to a friend's house whose parents were just wildly irresponsible so we could do whatever we want there. And we all ate a bunch of mushrooms. And I was a cocky asshole and we had a black mushroom in the batch and everyone was like, I don't want to eat that. And I was like, you're all pussies, I'll eat it. Uh -huh. That was one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in my life. And so I ate the damn thing and I had the worst trip of my life. And part of it was stumbling into my friend's backyard and it was raining and I just fell into a puddle and just fully closed, just fell into this puddle. And I was like looking up at the sky, like rain falling down on me. And like, I was seeing these visions of these doctors hmm. and they were just saying like, oh, he's just another kid who fried his brain on drugs. Like, great, he's going to die. Like stupid asshole. Like, why did he do this to us? And then luck, I was very fortunate in that a, sh a picture of my mother shot in front of my, in front of my face. And I was like, well, okay, I'm not going to die here. I'm not doing that to her. Like, if, even if not for me, I'm not doing this to my mom. So I got up and I walked inside. And then the wildest part was I realized that I was not in a puddle. It was not raining. It was sunny out and I was not wet. Uh -huh. This whole thing was made up in my head. But that stayed with me because I thought through all the drugs I'd done, because I didn't stop. I kept doing drugs for a long period of time. Because my last break, my biggest breakdown was at 26. Hmm. And so that was almost 10 years later of still partying just as hard, if not harder. And so I had thought that I had ruined my brain. I thought that I had reached the point of no return and that I was just a crazy person now because I know that happens to people that you can go so far out that you don't come back. And I thought that had happened to me and that I was screwed. Hmm. And I was seeing, like, I, I experienced my internal world as almost like a series of energetic beings swimming around, interacting with each other. And I, I see shapes and I see colors and I see temperatures and, and I see beings that interact with each other in these, these complex ways. And so for me, I like, I look into my internal world and I literally see like a, a bunch of energy spirit beings just swimming around in there. This is like a visual sense or you feel it in your body or how, how are you working? Both. It's, both. Both. it's visual and I can feel it mm -hmm. and I can hear it. And you can see this in other people too, or, or perceive it in other people. I can't see it in other people. So just yourself. I can only see it in myself. Uh huh. Because I can, I have the third eye window into my own being. I can't see into other people's beings, but I use my internal sense to intuit what's happening with them. Mm hmm. Because I, I, it's been my experience that we're more similar than we are different. Mm -hmm. So as long as you understand yourself on a fundamental level, you essentially understand everyone else. Mm hmm. And so for me, I see these little beings swimming around in my body and I know where they all are. I, I have full body awareness. It's like, so I know who's in my hip. I know who's in my foot. I know who's in my shoulder. I know who's in my gut. I know who's in my heart. Like there's all these different people that live in my body. And I'm aware of all the ways in which they relate to each other and interact with each other. And so if, if, if you if ever hang out with me for a long period of time, you'll notice me like shift my arms a lot, shift my body a lot. And it's because I'm making space for all these different people in my body to, to inhabit their space more comfortably. Mm. So you see me shift a lot and it's, it's because of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how did taking mushrooms that time and having this fear come up relate to this skill? Well, because when I first saw it, I thought I was going crazy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I thought I was, because it was so real to me uh -huh. and it was new. Uh -huh. I remembered what it was like before and I uh -huh. didn't see things like this. Yeah. And so I was like, holy fuck, I'm one of those crazy people. Uh -huh. I'm one of those people that sees more than he should and doesn't know what to deal with it and am becoming overwhelmed by it. And great, this is how it happens. This is how people go crazy off too much drugs. They see more than they can handle. They become more than they can handle mm. and they lose touch with reality. Great. 
Mm-hmm. That's what happened to me. Mm-hmm. And so that mushroom trip where I saw those doctors saying those things to me, that scared me. And so when I started developing this skill or this way of being or whatever you want to call it, I thought it was more evidence that I'd broken myself. Mm. How has your relationship to this skill changed over time? Oh, it's, I'm incredibly grateful for it. It's my superpower. Mm-hmm. It's the only reason I'm good at my job. It's the only reason I'm good at shadow immigration. Um, so it's, it's the biggest gift and asset I, I could have ever asked for. Like it mm-hmm. allows me a real, true, genuine self, a full and complete, or a full, genuine sense of complete self mastery. Mm-hmm. Wow. So we sort of surfaced that this is a, a skill that you had because we were talking about like how you give yourself this kind of love. How did that connect? So that, because that's what I would do is I, I would like go into my world and I would mm-hmm. look at all these different parts of myself and how they interact with each other. And I would use my senses to be like, okay, if I move like this, does that make you feel better? Or does that make you feel worse? Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, okay, so that makes you feel worse. All right, how about if I work, use this? And it's like, okay, that makes you feel better. So, okay, what if I think this thought? And I would just kind of sit there with this part and be like, what if I think this? Okay, well, what if I think this? Okay, well, what if I hold you like this? Okay, what about this? And I would just try over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And I would nor- eventually learn patterns of things that worked consistently over time and those became my practices and those became part of my foundation um but it relates to it because i could see everything so clearly it was so easy for me to do my trial and error testing because i could just say here you are well yeah i mean that that's really helpful because that 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 feels like a bit more specific and so far as even if like i don't have the skill you're talking about definitely self-awareness and and of various kinds but not not the kind you're talking about and it seems like um the two things I'm hearing that might be, um, well, to take a step back, <laughs> part of the reason I'm interested is like hearing you talk, I'm recognizing, I'm like, oh, I definitely get these needs met by my relationships with women. And like, that's something, yeah, you said like that could destroy you. Um, and it's not intrinsically bad, but like, um, I'm imagining that like, if I'm only able to meet those needs through relationships with women, bad things will happen for me and others. I don't want that. Uh, But if I learn how to more fully meet those needs for myself, which I already do to some extent, but certainly could do more of, um, then like actually I'll have really good relationship with myself and with others that's like healthy and good for everybody. And so I'm invested in this conversation and like learning how to do that for myself. And so what I'm hearing from you, even if I don't have that skill right now, and presumably a number of people listening won't, is like identify what the needs are that you're meeting through this unhealthy thing, whatever it is, you're, the, the thing that you have an unhealthy relationship with, um, and then just running a lot of tests of what can help me meet those needs, taking a guess, trying things, noticing if it works, noticing if it doesn't, and uh, kind of iterating on that. Yeah, and uh, my experience has been you don't, because I, I don't know how many people have this skill. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be fully honest, I've been too afraid to ask. Mm-hmm. Um, which occurs to me now is silly because I'd be fine knowing if I was the only person. I'd, in fact, I'd, that'd be a source of pride for me if I were to find that out. <laughs> <laughs> but, I bet you're not. I, I, there are people I've met that, uh, uh, I mean, people tend to be reserved about talking about this sort of thing, but I, I, I would guess over here, they're not the only person with this skill. Yeah, I would assume so. Yeah. But what I've learned is that it's not a prerequisite mm-hmm. because you can get these answers. As long as you know what questions to ask, you can always get the answers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can, at the very least, you know, if you experience tension in your shoulder, like mm-hmm. you may not be able to see the part, you may not be able to see all the parts around it and their relationships with each other. Like you may not be able to see the, like the internal community themselves, but you know, if you have tension in your arm mm-hmm. and you know, if holding a certain kind of awareness or gentle attention on that tension makes it tighter or, or looser. Mm-hmm. At the very mm-hmm. least, everybody has that. Mm-hmm. Like if you have a tightness in your gut, there's a way that you can relate to that that tightens it. And there's a way you can relate to it that softens it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so even if you can't see all the parts in their internal relationships with themselves, you can still, you still have a body mm-hmm. and the body still creates sensations. And as long as you're willing to lend credence to the idea that those sensations are the result of parts having emotional experiences, that your attention and your relationship will have an impact on if you're willing to believe that then you can still experiment from there Mm -hmm, definitely 
I'm not sure. It's interesting. I'm not even sure why I'm interested other than it, it's an interesting question to ask, but like, um, because it feels a little bit voyeuristic, but I'm, I'm going to trust that there's an intuition here. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, I imagine, you know, you want sort of unlock the skill at 18 and then you've been evolving it since then. I imagine that sort of what you saw within yourself at 18 is radically different than what you see now with the skill and like what's changed. What is that like? What, what's changed that's, over the years? That's actually a really cool question. And I'm, I, I'm glad you asked it because mm -hmm. this is a cool thing I have never gotten to talk about, but it mm -hmm. is really kind of cool. So in the beginning, it scared the shit out of me. Um, and I did discover it about 18. Um, and about 19, I remember, I discovered the law of attraction at 19. Mm. And I was working in a warehouse in Orange County at the time. And I, I, in the beginning, I didn't understand shadow integration, but I understood law of attraction. So I understood positive thinking. Can, can you say how you think about that now, just in case someone's not familiar with that? Like oh, what that yeah, is? Yeah. Uh, so law of attraction is this idea that your thoughts and beliefs create your reality. And that I absolutely believe in. Mm -hmm. But the part I don't believe in is what a lot of people do that we talked about earlier with affirmations will be like, I'm this and I'm this and I'm this and I'm this and all the different parts of them will be like, no, the fuck you're not. Mm -hmm. And so they end up just pushing them away, which creates an internal conflict, which is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the law of attraction was one of the worst things for my mental health mm -hmm. because I was practicing it without knowledge of shadow integration. Mm -hmm. So you were creating was, internal conflict through it. Yeah. So I was creating conflicts that the more intense they got, the more energy I had to put into fighting them so I could be positive, which made them have to fight me harder. And so it just created this whole terrible conflict that eventually got so intense that it overwhelmed me and, and almost swallowed me whole. What, what, what did that look like exactly? Like what, what were some of the conflicts you were creating? And yeah. Um, well, it's just like the first one, I'm a bad person. That mm -hmm. was still really alive in me at the time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to think that I was a great person. Mm -hmm. And so, so part of you is like, oh, hell no. Yeah, exactly. And I'd be like, no, I'm great. Shut the fuck up. Look, I'm amazing. And it's like, uh -huh. I'm, I'm wonderful. I'm amazing. It's like, nope, nope. You're the worst person on the planet. And so there was just this conflict that eventually started to swallow me whole. And obviously it's like, if I was a really good person, would I really be telling some part of myself to shut the fuck up? And like, no, I'd probably be listening. Like a good person would actually. Mm -hmm. be. So at the time I didn't know that though. So what I would use this skill for in the very beginning was a highly sophisticated uh, repression tool hmm. where I would see a part of my personality come up and take center stage and I could push it out of the way hmm. and I could like compartmentalize it and wrap it up in other parts and just like put it in a little box and shove it away somewhere. Hmm. And so I got really good at doing that. So it, I had what felt like a clear mind because anytime any part of me would come up, I could just like boop, boop, like compartmentalize and put it all away. And at 19 years old, I thought I'd stumbled onto something wonderful um, until I realized that all that was doing was compartmentalizing my mind, which actually isn't good because I was always taught that that was good. Hmm. And I realized how bad that is. How, how did you bad. realize that at the time? Oh, it's just because it made everything worse. Uh -huh. You know, like all the conflicts got stronger and I was having hmm. to put more and more of my energy into fighting these different parts of myself and they would get stronger and I would get weaker and I was like something about this isn't right and when I learned shadow integration it all made perfect sense mm -hmm. um but so yeah in the beginning it was a highly sophisticated repression tool that would allow me to compartmentalize and lock all these different parts of myself in little boxes which was fine and healthy and good thank you fucking cat so with that was fine and healthy and good for a long period of time um but then eventually it got you know, unbearable. And so I had to learn shadow integration. But then once I did learn shadow integration, I became aware of the fact that I had just been repressing all these different things. And I was like, oh, wow, I have to undo all of those knots I tied. Mm -hmm. I have to like take all those parts that I put away. I have to take them back. I have to integrate them. And it was just like, it was honestly kind of daunting because it was like, fuck, like I had spent years setting everything up in a way I thought that was good. But all I was doing was making things worse. So now I have to go and redo all that in a more painful way. It's going to take longer. And it's like, fuck, it was really daunting. But once I started getting good at it and I started gaining momentum, I was like, actually, this is way better and way cooler. And I'm really glad I learned this skill because now I can actually turn my life into something worthwhile. So what does it look like inside now that's sort of different than that? Well, it's a lot more harmonious. Because in the beginning, it was just like, 
all the parts were angry. They were all angry with each other and themselves and me and constantly fighting for attention and pushing each other out of the way and, and like burying each other and fighting and just it was just constant chaos and constant mm -hmm. torture in my being all the time it was like uh like like i'm in the comic books and i'm, I'm re-watching uh daredevil and like mm -hmm. when he's a little kid his his gift as an adult is he can sense everything but when he's a little kid it's so overwhelming he's just laying in bed like hoping to god that he just gets through the day that's what it was like for me it was like mm. a superhero who doesn't know how to manage their powers mm. is what it felt like and so in the beginning it was all chaotic and it was all really painful it felt like i was being tortured and torn apart from the inside but once i realized that i could smooth all that out and i could actually all these relationships could be healthy and harmonious now the chaos is more or less non-existent like there's a couple different knots like right now there's a there's a conflict happening between my feminine side and my masculine side that happens in my shoulder hmm. masculine side kind of collapses and then feminine side like takes over and tries to be the more powerful dominant force hmm. Hmm. and that actually creates a lot of pain in my shoulder hmm. and so what i have to do is i have to acknowledge that that's happening acknowledge that the masculine side is afraid and like i can i can feel my shoulder melting a little bit as i just say that hmm. and so i just acknowledge that i'm like look i know you're afraid but like you need to be in charge because the feminine side is just a bunch of emotions and you can't trust that part to make decisions for you you're the one that needs to take all those emotions into consideration make the decisions because you're the one capable of that hmm. it's like okay yeah you're right i do need to be in charge feminine side doesn't hate me even if she acts like it she's just mad that i'm not doing my job hmm. so I just do my job and that starts to smooth out and the pain goes away. Hmm. And I have to do that pretty consistently because that's an ingrained pattern. But that's kind of what it looks like now is I'll hmm. see a knot and I'll be like, all right, so that knot is made up of how many parts? Like one, two, three, four, five different parts. Like three, three, four. What are you guys nodding around? What's inside that that you're protecting? Hmm. And like I'll ask questions and I may need like a knot, like you may have to take off one string at a time. And it's like, okay, like, so this guy was on top. So I got him dealt with. And now I can see the whole thing a little bit clearer. It's like, yeah, but this one's getting in the way, so I can't see that. So let me get that out of the way. And then more and more, you get little hints into what they're all surrounding. It's like, okay, so they're all surrounding this pain. It's like, great, cool. What's the pain? Can I feel the pain yet? No, this part won't let me feel the pain. So let me peel that back. Can I feel the pain now? A little bit. I can feel it a little bit, but this guy's still guarding. So let me peel that back. It's like, can I feel the pain now? It's like, yes, I can feel it a lot more, but this one's still holding on. So let me get through with that. And then boom, all the pain unlocks. I can feel it. I can integrate it and move on. Hmm. So that's kind of what it looks like in my internal world. Hmm. Hmm. you said you'd never talked about this before um were, well did you ever have bad experiences of like trying to tell someone about this and then something bad happening not really uh -huh. um i haven't really tried uh -huh. Uh -huh. um the only other person i've ever tried to explain it to is my ex-girlfriend because she just wanted to see if she could replicate it uh -huh. she just wanted to see if she could learn from it so i've tried to explain it to her um and she's very loving and open and supportive. So I've never had any bad problems because I've also never tried. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I've ever talked about it to anybody hmm. um, other Did, than her. And my mom. I've talked to my mom about it because she was there when I was afraid of it. Uh -huh. Was it because of the fear that you haven't talked about it much? Yeah, it just seems like, like I don't have a strong reason. Mm -hmm. Like most of the time I'll face my fear because I have a reason to. Mm -hmm. But I don't really see a whole lot of benefit to talking about this because mm -hmm. I, I assume that even if some people have the skill, most people don't. Mm -hmm. And so I, just, I don't expect a whole lot of benefit to come from it. I expect mostly to be misunderstood without mm -hmm. really getting much in return. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Hmm. Do you have a story for like why you're only able to see your own body and not others? Because uh, I'm not in theirs. Uh -huh. If I were in their body, I could probably see it. Hmm. but this is the stuff swimming around in my being and my assumption is that because i don't know like i've never thought about it before but i don't really understand the mechanism mm -hmm. how it works that you can look inside yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not in a physical way but in a purely existential etheric way you can literally look into your being and so i i, I don't know who's doing the looking i don't know what eyes are looking i, I don't know how that process works mm -hmm. 
but to me it just always kind of made sense that I would be the only person I'd be able to see it Mm -hmm. like I can because I can see my inner world so well I'm really good at noticing patterns in other people so I can read people really well Mm -hmm. and I can and because I'm aware of my own subtleties I always know what people really mean when they say what they're saying and I always know what people really intend when they do what they're doing. So I always see what's hidden behind the veil. Like it's very hard to hide things from me, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean I see the parts. Mm-hmm. I just feel the energy and I see the body language and I hear specific word choices and sentence structures. And I know what would cause me to sentence my structure or structure my sentences in those ways or to hold that certain energy or to use that body language. And so I, I see myself mirrored on the world around me. And so I'm like, okay, like I, that's that. And so it's like, mm-hmm. I use my internal mapping to be able to tell what's happening with other people, but I can't see the parts themselves. Hmm. That's interesting. Cause I, I noticed just from people I've met that I have an into, like, again, not having this myself in, in quite the same way. I mean, the stuff you about reading people or voices. Yeah. But um, my intuition would have been that like, you would have been able to see other people and that there are people who can, but I, now it makes me wonder like, oh, are they just, um extrapolating or something like that uh yeah Yeah, maybe there are um Mm -hmm. but for me i just Mm -hmm. know myself on such a subtle and fundamental level that because it's because it's tough because you have to distinguish between what you're sensing and what you're projecting because you're projecting Mm -hmm. all the time and so you have to be able to distinguish between what you're actually sensing and what you're actually feeling versus what some unconscious part of you thinks it's feeling and that distinction takes a long time to work out. Mm. But once you can work it out, you know the difference between it's like, okay, I'm, this is me bullshitting and making up a story about this person, but this is also my very real sense. Mm. And so once you can distinguish those two, um, then you can be right most of the time. But again, I still don't see people's parts. I just see the fundamentals of what causes people to do the things that they do. Mm. And most of the time, I'm right. Mm. How did you learn to make those distinctions? Um, like well, between what you're projecting and what's what you're sensing? Well, most of the time you can feel the quality of it. Mm-hmm. Um, projections have an intense desire to be right. Mm. Um, projections usually have strong emotions associated with them. Mm-hmm. Um, they kind of feel a little bit more frantic. And when they come up, they tend to take over your consciousness. They tend to kind of possess you. Mm. Whereas insight doesn't do that. Mm. insight is just like when you look around the room and you see everything in the room you just see everything in the room like there's lights over there and there's that there and it's not that big of a deal you just kind of see what you see Mm -hmm. but if you look around the room and you see something that a part of you wants to project something on you'll fixate on it and you'll be Mm -hmm. like this thing and that's blah blah blah. and there's a certain quality to it and your 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 scope narrows and you're no longer just picking up information you're telling stories about the information Mm -hmm. and you're making the information personal and you're, you're getting all like tied up in knots about it. And you're making it mean stuff about the person and mm. all those different things. But insight doesn't do that. Insight's just like, oh, that's what's happening. Mm. It's, it's much more quiet. It's much more calm. When you notice that you're projecting something, how do you sort of dismantle that? Uh, first, I own that I'm projecting. Mm. And I'm just like, okay, so there's something unconscious that I'm projecting onto this person. And a lot of time, that's enough to break identification with it. And then from there, it's like, what are they doing? that I either wouldn't let myself do or that I have some kind of unconscious judgment about. Hmm. And then once I can identify whatever they're doing, I ask, okay, well, what stories am I telling myself about what they're doing? Hmm. And I identify the stories and it's like, okay. So that means that if I'm telling myself that same story about that same part of myself, hmm. they are simply embodying a part of myself. I have a story of. Hmm. and I can see that because they're embodied. And so I tell myself a story about what they're doing it's like, great. I take for granted that that means that I have a story about the same part of myself. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, what am I telling myself? Can I integrate that? Like, why mm-hmm. would I do that? Does it hurt? Does it, does it help me? Is it good? Um, are there any unconscious emotions that need to be expressed? Is there any part of me that needs to be nurtured so that this relationship can be healed? Mm-hmm. Um, things like that. When you're interacting with people, do you notice them having impacts on what you see in your body? Um... Yeah, I mean, there's there's always that space where you interact, you know, like with my coaching, in order to not take people's emotions on, I've had to learn how to distinguish, to distinguish the line in which my energy ends and theirs begins. Hmm. And so I get my insight from studying that line. 
Hmm. There's me holding my energy and then there's you holding your energy. And then there's what your energy does to mine. And from that and what mine does to yours and in that information that's gathered between how you impact me and how I impact you, I can extrapolate a lot from that. Hmm. So that's Hmm. where I get most of my information. Can you give me an example of like a hypothetical scenario of what that might look like? Yeah, let me think. Um, I mean, flirting with girls is the best one because Mm. women are so perceptive, even if they don't know it. Mm. If you bring the wrong energy to a woman, like texting is perfect. You could text the best thing in the entire world to a woman that you're interested in. But if your energy is wrong, she will feel it and she will not respond. Mm. That's just fucking how that just how it is. And so for me, whenever I'm talking to a woman that I'm attracted to, I'm always very aware of my energy. Mm. Where am I coming from? Uh, what am I saying? Why am I saying it? And all those sorts of things. Because I know that if I come to her with a certain kind of energy, I'm just not going to get what I want because I'm, I know I'm going to impact her, her in a way that has her either feeling not seen or not met or not carefied, cared or objectified in some way or just turned off and have her not want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. And so I know that. And so for me, it's just like, okay, like, so then what energy am I coming in with? Am I coming in as just like, I actually want to know you and I actually want to be close with you and have connection with you and know you as a person? Or am I just trying to get some unconscious need met through you and not even see you as a person? Mm -hmm. If I'm doing the former, then I usually get a pretty good response. But if I'm doing the latter, then usually I either get no response or a bad response. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, it's a pretty easy way to tell. Like women are far more perceptive than I think they even give themselves credit for because they can Mm -hmm energy shifts and they fucking know even if they are not consciously aware of what's happening they fucking know Mm -hmm. um so that's probably the best example i think Hmm. that makes sense so um trying to think how to ask this my sense from following you a little bit on twitter and it uh is well, it seems like you write more on Facebook, but sometimes post things on Twitter. And I'm, I'm, I'm not on Facebook, so I've mostly read what you post on Twitter. Uh, I mostly write on Instagram, and then I transfer everything I write on Instagram to my other platforms. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, it's, I notice that sometimes the things you write, like, and I've only read a little bit, but... Um, how to put this? I think they trigger cert- a certain part of me, and it certainly seems like they trigger other people sometimes. Mm-hmm. And specifically, the thing for me is like something around masculinity, and I can't I, I can't remember a specific thing, but it's like something about the way you talk about it that I'd be curious to like dive into, like what masculinity means to you, and like what exactly is triggering for me, and like what's at the at bottom there. And it's yeah. something like I know for me, I am very hungry for. Um, a refined version of masculinity for myself and the world, mm-hmm. but I have maybe certain like values about what that might look like. And I wonder like how you think about that stuff. And, and yeah, if you could just speak to that generally, and maybe we can dive into some sure. of the specifics. Yeah, we're, well, it's big. So mm-hmm. I'll start with saying that I started to, where do I want to start? so there's this whole thing about like rebranding masculinity or like redefining it or all these sorts of things which is where you get like divine masculine and then like toxic masculinity and i i I just think all those terms kind of don't hit the mark Mm. because like masculinity is fine like it doesn't need to be refined it doesn't need to be changed It's, it's an archetypal energy that has always been here and always will be here the idea that it could be refined to me is ludicrous which is completely ridiculous. Whereas when people talk about masculinity, what they're talking about is a lack of masculinity. What they're talking about is somebody with a masculine essence living in their feminine side, mm. and not having access to their stability and their strength and their ferocity and what they need. Mm. What they're talking about is weak men. They're not talking about strong men. They're talking about weak men. Mm. Genuinely strong masculine men are providers, they're mm. protectors, they're caretakers. They're selfless. They're the ones that run into the fire and save the baby. They're mm. the ones that do the hard thing and provide for their family no matter what. Like that's mm. what real genuine masculinity is. But when you don't have access to that part of yourself, 
you get overly emotional. You get overly like, cause if, if, if I'm a, if I'm like talks to masculinity, like one of the biggest things they talk about is like how you relate to women. Whereas if I know is I'm dope as fuck. I know that I am a, I'm a strong man with a good heart, who's desirable to women, um, is a good provider, capable of protecting himself and providing for his family. I'm not going to need to be overly possessive of my girlfriend. I know that if she stops loving me for whatever reason, that I'm desirable and wonderful and can find someone else to love. I don't have to act like an asshole. Hmm. But people only do that toxic shit when one of those pieces is missing, right? Like the, the constant thing that we see in the movies is the like deadbeat guy who doesn't have a good job and is just kind of a piece of shit and eats his wife. It's like, yeah, because if he was truly masculine, he would find a way to make his life work. Hmm. He would find a way to provide for his family. Or at the very least, he would know that they're in his care. And he would see that with a sense of honor and with a sense of duty. And so what we see when we talk about toxic masculinity is really a lack of masculinity. Hmm. And so I don't approve of that term. Same with divine masculine. Like there's no such thing. Like masculinity was already divine. Hmm. It was already an archetypal element of our reality since far before humans were ever created. So, and because most of the time when I hear divine masculine, what I hear is feminized masculine. Hmm. here is guys that want to appear masculine but actually more hold their their energy in their feminine side Hmm. i've never really heard a guy talk about divine masculinity that i actually saw as someone who was actually masculine Hmm. most of the time they're very like soft-spoken hand on the heart gonna like talk to you like this and it's like that's super feminine Hmm. that's just a feminine way of being and there's nothing wrong with that but i don't personally enjoy being told that like there's something wrong with because i'm very competitive i box on the weekends i work out every day i like to fight um i like all that stuff and i do that in service to the people i want to be a good fighter i want to be combat ready because the need may arise one day Hmm. i may need to protect my children or someone else's children When I was living in San Francisco, um, I had an old roommate, a guy named Alex, really good dude. And he was walking home from a club one day and he heard this girl get attacked. And so he was half drunk. So he didn't even think he ran into the alleyway and started to like, you know, break it up. And he got the shit beat out of him. He got sent to the hospital. Hmm. Um, For me, that's masculinity. But if he had embraced his masculinity beforehand and learned to become an actual living weapon, he would not have been sent to the hospital. He could have just gone and protected that woman and gotten out fine and be okay. Hmm. So that's my aim. That's why I box on the weekends. That's why I hang out with guys that occur to me as really genuinely masculine. Hmm. Like, like I don't hang out with spiritual guys generally. I have a couple guys that I hang out with that are, you know, spiritual transformational guys. But for the most part, uh, my friends are, they're like fighters. And they're hmm. like people that are a little bit more rugged and a little bit more hardcore and are more into like traditional masculinity because that's, Hmm. those are guys I trust. Those are guys I know I can walk down the street with at any given moment. And if anything happens, they're going to have my back. Hmm. The other thing about masculinity is it has honor. It has integrity. And when you get into this kind of like divine masculine stuff and you get more kind of feminized guys, they don't say the hard thing. Hmm. They are more worried with creating safe spaces than they are concerned with creating honest spaces. Hmm. And so they won't tell you the truth. Um, they'll withhold. The, the relationships aren't as strong. They aren't as healthy. Um, and guys that use that type of language generally can't help me become the type of man I want to become. Hmm. I really enjoy traditional masculinity. I want to be the most badass version of myself possible. There's nothing wrong with being lighthearted and feminine and soft-spoken and safe and all that sort of stuff but that's just not who i want to be and i just don't think it's genuine or sincere to actually call that masculinity hmm. especially because you don't know too much they'll be like like i wrote this thing the other day you might have seen about how like people say that real strength comes from vulnerability hmm. and it's like the fuck no it doesn't like hmm. real strength is what allows vulnerability to come to the surface hmm. like the, the presence of strength is what allows vulnerability to to exist in a place of safety without Hmm. strength if you expose your vulnerability to someone who's not strong enough to hold it they could re-trigger or re-traumatize you 
Whereas if you, if you expose your vulnerability to someone who's strong enough to hold it, that can be extremely healing. Hmm. So no, real, to me, real strength does not come from vulnerability. The real strength is what allows vulnerability to be held and transmuted. Hmm. And so I think spiritual communities, transformational communities, uh, progressive communities, a lot of these people have uh, maligned traditional masculinity as it is and tried to create a softer, safer version of it that they can feel more comfortable with along ideological lines. But masculinity was never meant to be safe. Hmm. Masculinity was never meant to be toned down. It is meant to be the tip of the spear that can kill if and when necessary. Hmm. It, is, it is the thing that drives us forward. It is, it is the piercing truth. It is, it's, it's leadership. It's, it's be facing the, the hard, difficult things so that the truly genuine and feminine people in your life don't have to. Hmm. It's, 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 it's that. And so I fight for that. So, and not everybody has to agree with that. Not everybody has to believe that. But for the people who do, the way that I write about masculinity, I know is refreshing hmm. because I read people who write similar that I do. And when I hear them talking similar to the ways that I write, I feel refreshed. I feel invigorated. I feel understood. I feel like it's okay to be the way that I am. And it's okay to develop this. And I can still be a good person while holding these, what I consider to be sacred honors and sacred duties um, as sacred. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I, how to put this? I feel confused because um, my experience of it is like 90% being refreshed by uh, what you're talking about. And, and when I read what you read about this, like, oh yeah, I really resonate with a lot of this. I like it. And 10% uh, like, being alienated or like disconnected from it or um and I can't tell in my experience if that means either um I'm sort of like hurting because there's something pointing to that I could grow in or because uh uh what I want is actually meaningfully different or it could be both I wouldn't be surprised if it was both yeah. Uh, to be honest, because I, I think, I, yeah, I think that's my sense right now. What's that? Especially if it's a 10%. Yeah, I mean, it might be like, well, I, I think it, maybe it's like 10% uh, triggered. And then like, I think I want like 20 or 30% different, uh, if that makes sense. I feel, I feel, yeah, bo both of those things. Um, mm, I'm wondering, yeah, I don't know. Uh, how does that land for you? Or do you have any reflections on that? Sense. Um, that's an experience that I, I understand a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. um, and to be totally honest, mm -hmm. I consider that as not really my problem. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, and the reason I say that is you haven't taken the stance, but a lot of times people like the thread that you were talking about earlier, um, the one where you read, um, that thread actually upset somebody and mm -hmm. they were saying that they wanted me to be much more gentle about certain things. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be because mm -hmm. that's the whole point. Um, and so there have been people that have been really upset with me. There are people that have demanded different versions of me and a lot of different things. And I just like, okay, cool. Like, because I aim to, when I, when I do write about that or write like that, which I don't do that much, but when I do, my aim is to convey this sense of, because there's a very real element to the world that doesn't give a fuck about what we think or what we feel. Mm -hmm. There are just some things that are what they are and there isn't anything you can do about it. You just have to engage with it as it is. Mm -hmm. Like the ocean, it's wonderful and it's beautiful and it's amazing. But if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, it'll fucking kill you. And it doesn't care and it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. And the world is like that in a lot of ways where if for men, if you don't step up and if you don't claim your space in the world or if you don't make something for it it won't happen hmm. like if you do not become the person that the woman of your dreams finds desirable you're gonna have to settle for someone less hmm. that's the lie i think like, i don't make the rules that's not i don't that's not my fault but that is how it is if i don't create the life that i want if i don't become somebody who can provide for the family that i want it won't happen and I'll regret it and I'll feel like shit. And the woman of my dreams would probably go find someone else who can protect her and care for her. 
Hmm. Because that's the type of woman that I would want. And so it's like, the world is fucking heartless in a lot of ways. Hmm. And as men, I think it's our responsibility to deal with the ways in which the world is heartless, make peace with it, become bigger than it, and leverage it for the good of ourselves and our communities. So when I communicate a lot of those things, I, I, don't, I don't know what's happening with you, but I know it rubs up against a lot of people that wish things were different. Mm -hmm. Because I get a lot of ideological responses. People be like, oh, wouldn't the world be better if people didn't compete with each other? It's like, yeah, the world would be better if you could drink ocean water. Like mm -hmm. a lot of things would be better if they were different, but they're not. Mm -hmm. You do have to compete with people if you want to get ahead. Mm -hmm. You do have to have a certain kind of attitude if you want to make life work for you. Like, I'm sorry that you don't like that, but mm -hmm. that's how it is. Mm -hmm. And embracing those facts have helped me overcome them and leverage them and help and help me build the life that I want. Whereas avoiding them and wishing they were different has always kept me disempowered. And mm -hmm. so when I write that stuff, it's just like, you can get upset about this or you could accept that it's true and deal with it forthrightly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be clear, uh, uh, the degree of triggered isn't like, oh, I'm, it's, I noticed it like flagged something for me. I think, Ooh, that's interesting. Like, what's that about? And mm -hmm. uh, I can handle myself and also, I don't, yeah, I don't, I like, yeah, and, and also, like, I don't really need you or want you to be different, like, you, you are very clearly doing your thing, you know, like, I'm like, hell yeah, man, like, I love seeing somebody that's, like, doing his thing, like, amazing, you know, I'm, I'm, like, really proud of you, to be honest, I'm like, hell yeah, you know, and um, I, like, uh, well, how to put this, yeah, I want to understand you better and where you're coming from and what this sort of, like, thing that's flagged for me is, so that I can learn from that and also like suss out what's how I see things because because for me I know I, I I don't think I would have known this like two years ago even but like if if I fully integrate the thing that's like flagged for me on reading what you write or hearing what you say like I'm going to go in a direction that looks different than what you're talking about I'm not going to become yeah. you like I'm not going to do the same things you do and oh. like me living my fullest life is going to look really different mm -hmm. but but like this conversation is an occasion to like understand you better and like go in the direction that I do need to go, if that makes cool. sense. Yeah. And there's yeah. a lot of beauty in that. Like I learn because I read people that are way more triggering and way more upsetting than I am. Hmm. People that say things that I just objectively, morally disagree hmm. with, uh -huh. think are wrong and bad. Uh -huh. I still read what they write uh -huh. because it's like you could be, or you could be morally reprehensible in 10% of your thoughts, but if you've created something that I that I want, I will listen for the parts that are valuable. Mm. Even if I hate certain parts of you, mm. I will acknowledge that you've created something that I want and I will listen for how you did it and I will integrate my version of it. Huh. Huh. Yeah. So I listen to some really hardcore people that are really just in a lot of ways, bad people, mm. but they've been able to create amazing lives. And so I, I sort through integrate my triggers like mm -hmm. you said and like okay it's like okay so i don't like that i don't like that i really don't like that but this is a little nugget that i can integrate so i'm going to take that and run with it mm -hmm. yeah and also just to be clear i don't find anything you're saying morally reprehensible so uh, <laughs> Good. not that you'd be offended if i did but uh, <laughs> yeah. just want to go on record i haven't heard anything that's morally reprehensible just more cool. like mm, that's interesting that that pings me a certain way um, appreciate that. Yeah, because a big thing for me is, like I said before, is like I had to face the reality of death as a seven year old. Yeah, no, totally. That is that's like very present hearing you. Like I'm, I did not have to do that at seven, and you did, <laughs> yeah. and like very different life experiences. Yeah, from that. You so know? There's just certain hardcore truths about reality that I had to make peace with, mm -hmm. and they were going to crush me if I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's true for a lot of other people, um, but for a lot of other people, they don't realize the degree to which that avoidance is costing them until it's too late. Mm. And I had to face it early on. So I'm grateful for that. But a lot of people won't realize like, oh shit, like it was really on me until it was too late. Mm. I want to give people the chance to have their existential crisis as soon as possible, mm. realize that it really is all on them. And th the norm is failure. Mm. And that most people will reach their deathbed unsatisfied and unfulfilled. And that the odds are against you. And if you want to be one of the exceptional people that goes to the grave with a smile on his face, you better start contending with these facts of life. 
Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense that like those sort of sort of like raw realities would be where a lot of this is coming from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's stuff you can't argue with that if you want it to be different, you're just inherently in a weaker position mm -hmm. than if you were to accept its reality and, and work with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, um, I, I can't remember other things in the past that have flagged this, but in this conversation, the thing that's flagged it for me is like, um, when you use the word weak, like weak men, you yeah. know, it's like, oh, so, so I think, for, what's that? Tons of people hate that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I don't want to be like, I'm, I'm sitting with it. And it's like, I don't want you to judge me. And I don't want to like, I think maybe there's ways in which I am weak that I should be stronger. And so like hearing you use that word, is like, oh no, like, <laughs> um, and that's why it's important because it, it points to something. It's like, mm -hmm. there's, if there's a weak part of you, there's why that hurts. There's mm -hmm. weak parts of me. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to, cause this is why I don't like psychological reframes because people will be like, oh, it's not failure. It's an opportunity. It's like, no motherfucker, you failed. Mm -hmm. Like own the fact that you failed, learn why you failed, make peace with the fact that you failed so that you're not afraid of it anymore. Go forward, fail again until you get it wrong. Hmm. just like with weak it's like yeah there are parts of me that are weak i don't do all the things i want to do hmm. because there are parts of me that are so scared and so weak that they don't do it hmm. so let me figure out what's got them so scared what's got them showing up weak let me deal with that so i can get them strong and they can do the things that they need to do hmm. 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 i'm trying to think how to ask this but like uh oh how to ask this um well, first off, yeah, that like I'm I'm like kind of chewing on this what this flags for me, and I think like I just have to go sit with that and think about that and reflect on it and act on it. So thank you for flagging that. My and pleasure. um, how to put this? So again, I don't want to change you. I don't want to change you. I'm not in this to change you, but I am curious about you, and so I want to ask you a question that could sound like I'm trying to change you, but I'm just curious <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, like the setup. That's so okay. Fun. Uh, so the question is like. Hmm, in my model of people, if people feel judged, they're not going to be in a position of psychological safety and so won't be able to make changes. So it seems to me that the language that you use would pose the risk of making people feel judged, not have the psychological safety, and not be able to make a change. Um, do you see that differently? Or like, why do you make that choice rhetorically? Or what, what, how do you see that kind of thing? Yeah, so I distinguish because the people that will feel judged by how I want to say something. Mm -hmm. And instead of contending with it forthrightly, like you have, mm -hmm. want to project on me and blame me and tell me that I'm a bad guy. Mm -hmm. I don't want their attention. Mm -hmm. I don't want to work with them. They're going to be annoying and they're not my problem. I mean, to me hearing you said, like just in this conversation, it's like, oh, I need to judge myself as weak. And that's why that's <laughs> flagging. And then like sit with that and learn from it. Uh, totally. Yeah. And so, and if, and, and if someone like that were to be like, yeah, you know, like it hurt, but it hurt because it's right. Mm -hmm. And I want to become the kind of guy that you're talking about. Cause that's how it's done for me. Like the people that I've listened to are way harsher than me. Mm -hmm. They're like, yo, you are never going to fucking make it. Mm -hmm. Chances are you're never going to make it. Mm -hmm. And I had to accept the truth of that because most people don't. Mm -hmm. And so I've been like, yeah, it sucks to be saying it that way, but like, he's right. Mm -hmm. If it weren't true, more people would be satisfied and successful and happy, but they're not. So he's got to be right. Mm -hmm. So I've contended with that and I've chosen to learn and make sure that I'm one of those people. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that I want to teach. And those are the people that I want around me. And mm -hmm. those are the people that I want engaging with my content. The type of people who get so upset by the concept that maybe part of them might be weak and they can't accept that. It's like probably not going to be a very good client probably going to be waiting at every turn to attack me and criticize me and pick apart everything that I have to say anyway. So mm. just let them do it. Hmm. I wonder if that's sort of um, another difference is like, I mean, you know, so I come from a Buddhist background and uh, I don't know, um, 
my own, I, I feel the, the metaphor I've been using recently for this is like, you know, those like in Christianity, how there's like, oh, there's the Catholic church and there's the Episcopalians and the Baptists. And then there's like, if you especially go in the South, there's like these like pop-up churches that have like rented a cafeteria or something. And it's sure. like, they're just like, they're not with any tradition. They're just like the kind of the people that go to that place and do Christianity. Uh -huh. You know, like I'm like that with Buddhism. Like I'm just, I'm just out in the reservation <laughs> doing my own thing. Um, and, uh, Anyway, but but certainly in Buddhism and, and Mahayana Buddhism in particular, there's like a commitment to being of service to all beings and a love for all beings. And so like, I, I'm, I'm kind of flat. You're like, oh no, I can only help these people. And whereas me, I'm like, oh, I got to at least like um, be in a position that I could help all people. Like not all people are going to accept it or I'm not going to be able to help, all, but I have to like do my damnedest to be able to help everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I, I wonder if that's, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that might be a difference between us as well. Yeah, I mean, I used to think that way, mm. but it's really exhausting. Uh -huh. It's really exhausting, mm. um, especially because you end up catering to the lowest common denominator. Mm. And that's not what I'm into. Mm. I don't want to cater to the lowest common denominator. Mm. There is, I want to help the people that are ready and willing to reach for who they are capable of being mm. to help them go all the way. Mm. There are plenty of other people that will help you make peace with like not going all the way. Like I don't want, I don't want to help people, I don't want to help people cope. Hmm. I'm not interested in coping. Hmm. I'm interested in overcoming, transmuting, and integrating and turning things into power. Uh -huh. And so a lot of times when I would work with the lowest common denominator, a lot of it was coping. Hmm. To me, that's stagnancy. It's boring. It's hmm. like, and so for me, I ultimately got to the point where I was like, well, this is where I'm going. Mm. this is where i want to go mm. so i'm only going to talk to people that want to go where i want to go. Mm. and if you want to go somewhere else then i trust that there's plenty of other people that'll help you get to where you want to go but this is where i'm going mm -hmm. so all aboard motherfuckers mm -hmm. if you want to come get on mm -hmm. and if you want to go somewhere else then cool listen mm -hmm. to someone else because there's no shortage of coaches mm -hmm. or teachers or people to listen to so because of that i'll just talk to the people that like what i have to say mm. That doesn't mean I won't love everybody else. It doesn't mean that I won't care about them. Uh -huh. I just don't really want them in my circle. Yeah. I think I've dealt with that problem in a different way. Like I, I don't um, like it, it makes sense that it would be like, I forget the word you use, but sort of like de-energizing and exhausting or something to like deal, deal with what you call it. And I think like for me, the way I handle that is like, I only do projects or things that are energizing for me. And like the things that I've found energizing are like, not things that anyone told me I could do or that would be predictable in advance, but I'm like, I'm gonna go in the direction of what's actually energizing. And from that perspective, it's like, okay, I will make this in a way that it could help as many people as possible. But um, yeah. Plus, there's also the difference between a church and a business. I don't mm. run a church. Right, right, right. So right. with church you have, or, or religion, you have monks that don't need to get paid and they have mm -hmm. a place to live and they're mm -hmm. not worried about money. Right. And so they can just sit there and give love to everybody. And there's a <laughs> uh -huh. right. Me, I have a business to run. Right. I have a life I'm creating. Right. And so if I keep giving my energy to things and people that either can't afford me mm -hmm. or can't feed me in some way, then I'm giving a lot without getting anything back. And then my business doesn't get built. Mm -hmm. So in order for my business to get built, for me to create the life that I want to be the kind of person that I want, I really have to only do the things that really excite me. Mm -hmm. I only talk to the people that I'm excited to talk to. Mm -hmm. And so every time I talk to somebody or do something that isn't engaging for me, it literally, it literally costs me. Totally. Yeah. I don't run a church, but I'm more in that category, I suppose. So totally. yeah. And I was like that for a long time. Yeah. Um, but then I started to value money because I realized mm -hmm. that it really is actually the solution to 99.9% .9 of our problems. Mm -hmm. Once I understood that, I was like, okay. But mm -hmm. I do still consider myself having a, ethical responsibility to everybody who can't afford me mm. and that if they write in with questions or whatever i'll write a piece of content for them i'll i'll have them coached indirectly through me um in a way that i still benefit from but then i can put most of my attention on the people that are helping me pay my bills and build a life that i want to have so mm -hmm. I, I feel a, an ethical obligation and responsibility for the people that can't afford me but I don't really feel much responsibility or obligation to people who don't like the way mm -hmm. that I speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, there's just so many choices out there. If you don't like me, like you could just look, find someone else two seconds later and forget I ever existed. Like it's so easy to turn the channel that yeah. I don't see any reason to do it other than be 100% myself. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I um, I know. Yeah, again, just want to come back to like I really love what you're doing for you, and uh, I think it's great, and I feel I feel proud of you, and also proud of myself because it's like yeah, I'm also walking my own thing and um, learning what I need to and doing what I need to. So yeah. uh, it's nice okay. to just kind of compare notes. <laughs> totally, man. I've, I yeah, really, really, really enjoyed this conversation. So. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about that is kind of nearby any of the things we've talked about or anything else? Um, let me think. No, you've been very thorough. This has been a super cool conversation. Um, nothing big off the top of my head other than um, I'm running a group course that starts next week. Great. Um, it's three months. Teach everything I know about shadow integration, which is a hell of a lot. There's lots of support available. So if you've liked what I've talked about, like, let me know. And I run a ton of courses. I have a men's group. I run my shadow integration course. And I also have a uh, one-on-one -on -one class as well. Amazing. Amazing. We'll make sure to put links to that in the show notes. So. Thanks, Thanks so much and uh, really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, likewise, man. Thank you so much.